Okay, good evening to you all. So I hope the audio and video is clear. So today we will try to see some environmental current affairs from 2022 to 23. For the last one year, some of the major current affairs we'll see. So how we'll go about is we will start with uh, biodiversity, some of the important conventions and uh, newses, and then we'll get into some of pollutions. And finally, we'll get into climate change. And also we will try to see anything major that is given in the budget of 2023 related to the environment. So first we'll start with some international convention related to biodiversity. So it is the conference of party 15 of convention on biological diversity. So that is a, you know that that's one of our important convention related to our biodiversity. You can say it's a master convention. So the 15th conference of party, actually it is called Quinming Montreal Declaration. So why it is called Quinming Montreal is this convention, actually it has happened in two part. The part one in the last year 22, it happened in uh, the Quinming of China. The part two, it was concluded in Montreal. So it has actually happened two times. So that is something called Quinming, actually Montreal Declaration. So what is the main uh, thing about us? We have to go for a new global framework. So what are the new global framework? Before uh, in CBD, we had one target from 2010 to 2020 that is called Aichi target. I hope you remember. So the target is over. So IG 20 target. So India has taken the 20 target into 12 national biodiversity target and it was completed by 2020. So after 2020, they have taken a new target that is called post 2020 new biodiversity framework. So actually the target is for 2050, that's a long-term target. The short term is 2030 because we have our sustainable development goal that is by 2030 agenda. So that is how we have taken this 2030 target. So that is, it is called as Global Biodiversity Framework, GPF. GBF, it is a 2030 target. So in 2030, that is without, within 2030, we have to achieve 23 target that is subdivided into four goals. So that is our idea. So here, it is not possible for you to remember all the 23 target, but at least you can have one glance of this 23 target. So what is what way it is going to be different from the Aichi target is, so they say that IG target, according to convention, it is a failure because of two reasons. The one reason why IG target is a failure is it is lack of budget. That is lack of finance. And the second reason what they told about IG target is there is no clear indicator. Because whenever you set a, when you set a target, there should be a very clear target, clear indicator should be there in terms of measurable. So it was not there in the IG target. That is what the CBD convention says. But in the global biodiversity framework, they say that this two problem will be rectified. So the 23 target, whatever they are going to keep, it is going to have some clear target that is clear indicator. At the same time, they are going to give more fund for it. So for this, under the global environment facility, they have created one fund especially for this uh, particular declaration, it is called Special Trust Fund. Especially to support the GBF. So we can say that comparing with the older IG target, this 2030 global biodiversity framework target, I will say that it will have comparatively much more better clear indicator. Number two, it will also have better funding for it. So that is a difference it comes. So what are the key points? So first thing is 30 by 30 deal. So under this, the key target is within 2030, that is 2030 agenda, 30% of the land and 30% of the ocean, we want to bring it under the protected area. So as of now, 17% of the land and 8% of the ocean is not under the protected area. But so uh, sorry, it's, not, it's under the protected area. Now we have to increase to 30-30. So that is called 13 to 30 deal. The second important target is we have to stop the extinction 
of species by 2050. So right now the sixth, you know that the sixth mass rate extinction is very rapid. So we have to control the sixth mass rate extinction. So for that reason, at least by 2050, we have to reduce. So in that as a target, they say that we have to reduce at least 10 fold times the extinction rate. The third one is we have to reduce the risk of pesticide by 50 percentage because pesticide some or other way it results in water pollution as well as in soil pollution and also you know that many pesticides is a carcinogen mutagen and also sometimes some pesticide may also contain some nutrient so pesticide control is another one and then we have to reduce the loss of nutrients to the environment by 50 percentage so the soil nutrient loss which is also soil erosion soil degradation is also a major one so that also we have to control the next one we have to reduce the pollution risk and also pollution risk and negative impact of pollution on all the organism see because today organ if you take any biodiversity so whether a plant or animal can take pollutants yes they can take pollutant within a particular limit so here we are not completely so the target is not completely eliminating the entire pollutant we have to reduce the pollutant to a level where the biodiversity can sustain so that is how it is given that is not harmful reduce the level that are not harmful to the biodiversity and ecosystem functioning and then we have to reduce the global footprint of consumption so it's related to the agriculture consumption so here over consumption should be controlled and at the same time food waste so that also should be controlled so uh, as a target we have to reduce off food waste so these are the some of the important target apart from that the next important target is to manage or control agriculture and agro allied so agro allied like aquaculture fisheries and all forestry so you know that some these activities sometimes we take it in a very unsustainable way so we want to make it in a very agro ecological basis at the same time biodiversity friendly basis so that's one then the next one is to tackle the climate change by nature based solution so by going for afforestation by improving the blue carbon ecosystem so that is another target and we have to control the next target is to control the invasive alien species at least by 50 percentage because you know that the main reason for the sixth mass rate extinction the first and foremost reason is a habitat loss the second reason is an invasive species so more the invasive species it will drastically reduce your biodiversity so control the invasive species. we cannot completely remove it because invasive it's not possible to completely remove the invasive because once you remove invasive it is something a position like we cannot keep it at the same time we cannot remove it so at least 50 percent reduction we want to commit by we have to bring it by 2030 and then the next one is about the trade on wildlife so anyway we are doing some trade on many wildlife plant and animal specimen for certain commercial benefit for medicinal benefits so we want to have a very safe or probably a controlled secured trade and coming to the urban so urban we have to increase the green spaces that's what green up of urban spaces so these are the some of the major target that was taken in the Quinming declaration totally if you see as a target it will be around 23 target that is divided into four goals so okay what is what you can expect from this Quinming declaration the first thing is as i told you money funding so the signatory what they have uh, accepted is we have to mobilize 200 billion dollar of money we have to channel for the conservation so that of course it's not uh, immediately in a long term from the government sources even from the private sources because we want the private also to participate in it so 200 billion dollar is a something a uh, uh, ultimate goal we have but as of now we want because we want to apply the concept of cbdr common but differential responsibility country like india and all we told very clearly that cbdr should be there because biodiversity laws is not happening only because of the country like but because of our because of the developing country many developed country has done a lot of biodiversity loss before that is start from the industrialization so that is the reason we want a commitment from the developed country to do give fund to start with 20 billion dollar at least the developed country has to fund by 2025 30 billion dollar by 2030 so if you directly see for the climate change in the green climate fund it is 100 billion dollar so you can keep in mind 100 billion dollar for the climate change 30 billion dollar for the global biodiversity framework for the cbd convention the second one is the quinming declaration the quinming Montreal declaration says that big companies 
the big companies large company large infrastructure project they do an activity that disturbs the biodiversity so we want a reporting system so every country should control their company's infrastructure company so that before a company any company or infrastructure company start any project they have to provide a clear assessment how their project is going to affect the biodiversity we want a complete report and at the same time the government has to the country government has to ensure that the company uh, have a proper mitigation for um, proper sorry proper mitigation plan for the conservation of the biodiversity because of their project so that is a second important thing the third one is subsidies so here subsidies when you come to subsidies you know that many countries are giving subsidies for fertilizers even india we are giving fertilizer so now fertilizer will result in you know that one is in uh, eutrophication because more the fertilizer goes to the lake goes to the ocean creates an algae bloom harmful algae bloom and all second more the fertilizer enters into the soil that also results in denitrification process you know denitrification process some nitro sorry some uh, pseudo monads and all when they react on the fertilizer they produce nitrous oxide which is a very powerful greenhouse gases so controlling subsidies will control your aquatic ecosystem will preserve your aquatic ecosystem as well as climate change so that is the reason we want to control so here the countries have committed at not to immediately remove it at least phase down and reform the subsidy anyway by at least by 2030 you have to control around 500 billion dollars of subsidies so you have to slash, slash out those subsidies you have to control it so that we can expect from the quinming so it's a very measurable target then you can see the monitoring and progress system so in this uh, convention or probably in this montreal declaration it was told that every five years once the country has to report so that we can see what progress it's going on in that and at the same time national action plan also should be created by the country and it has to be reviewed but anyway in this uh, you know in the climate change even in the paris agreement also every country has to come out with a national action plan that be reviewed but here some of the members of the cbd convention they said that it should not be something like a uh, sort of a you know deadline or commitment so countries will prepare their national guideline that is national action plan that will be submitted so it can be reviewed but there should not be any form of a, a legal commitment for it so that is what some countries told it so these are the things you can expect from the quinming montreal declaration mainly 30 by 30 deal now the next one the latest one the next one in the current affair is the sites convention conference of party 19 it held in panama you know sites it's a convention on Indi international trade in endangered species of wildlife flora and fauna so here <laughs> it is a intergovernmental treaty it's a legal binding treaty to control the legal trade to control the trade yes is of course the legal trade so here some plants and animals are being traded from one country to another country for some commercial even for many uh, you know for commercial or medicinal purpose so we don't want the trade to happen in such a way that at one point of time the species becomes extinct so it should not the main idea is the trade should not survive the uh, so should not threaten the survival of the particular species so that is the reason under the sites convention we have appendix 1 appendix 2 and appendix 3 you know that appendix 1 is something where no trade is allowed trade is completely pro uh, prohibited appendix 2 is something controlled trade i can say appendix 3 it is protected at least in one country so what directly will directly go what has the what is the resolution they have taken in that particular conference of party so more than 52 proposals uh, was made related to the regulation of uh, some of the species on the international trade especially on certain mammals like sharks sharks reptiles even hippopotamus hippos and uh, even in the rhinoceros and more than 200 tree species also was included in that more than 52 different types of uh, proposals was made so in this if you want to see the key one india <coughs> when come to the india so we have a tree called shisham it is also called as indian rosewood suppose people who cannot afford teak you know the teak is very costly people who cannot afford teak most of the time they go for this indian rosewood but the original rosewood is something very costly shisham it's also called as shisham shisham it is a indian rosewood so we want we made a proposal that that rosewood has to be put under indian rosewood that shisham has to be put under appendix 2 so by that way it was also put under the appendix 2 
so the benefit is because we are using for lot of uh, handicrafts and other thing even for furnitures and all so that it will boost our indian exports so anyway finally it was accepted and uh, today it is going to boost our indian handicraft exports so keep in mind shisham the second one is sea cucumber so india gave a proposal of putting sea cucumber in the appendix 2 so it is also accepted so tamil nadu you can see that it was the highest number of uh, uh, you know seizures we found especially in the marine wildlife seizures in even in the last year more than 4 crore worth of uh, sea cucumber was about to get uh, uh, smuggled so it was stopped by the wccb wildlife crime control bureau the second one is about the sea cucumber is a marine species the third one india has proposed one species that is called batakur kachuga it's called the red crowned roof turtle so it's a freshwater turtle so we want to uh, put it under the uh, sites convention so it was welcomed by the party members and also they appreciated the sites members also appreciated the wccb the world sorry the wildlife crime control bureau operation turtle so it is nothing but to control the poaching of uh, turtles and tortoise that also was appreciated and uh, the last one is about the ivory trade so coming to the ivory trade uh, so countries like namibia botswana south africa and even zimbabwe so they want <coughs> the ivory to be traded the elephant ivory to be traded so normally how the elephant ivory is traded in the sense some if sometimes if any seizure of any ivory or sometime uh, any dead elephant ivory and all they want to go for a a trade they want to have a systematic trade under the sites but whenever uh, they put for a vote uh, for a trade generally it will be rejected so if you take india for the last 30 years of time we oppose this ivory trade because if you allow a trade automatically you can see more demand will increase automatically more you know poaching and all will happen the chances of poaching will increase more so that's the reason india for the last 30 years of time we didn't support the ivory trade but for the first time we didn't vote against the ivory trade so when namibia moved forward actually we didn't vote it so we, we didn't vote against it so that means we supported for the ivory trade so why india has to do it it's only based on the national interest because namibia has requested we got cheeta from namibia so the namibia has requested not to vote against for the ivory trade for that reason we didn't vote it but anyway the namibia proposal was defeated so ultimately it was not accepted in the sites but it's a one important thing that india decided not to vote against the proposal to reopen the international trade in ivory so these are the things you have to keep in mind especially in the conference of party uh, <coughs> 19 okay so let's move to the next one slowly we'll come to the wildlife come to the indian context yes wildlife protection amendment bill so we have gone for a, there is a wildlife protection act you know that it's one of a very powerful act for the wildlife 1972 it was established for the protection of wildlife against poaching and as well as illegal trade or any sort of a poaching illegal trade or whatever it may be and uh, we did some amendment in 2003 and all so now there is a amendment bill of 2022 so anyway rajesh sabha has uh, you know has moved forward this bill so what are the major provisions of the bill why we have to go for the amendment is first thing is we have implemented some of the provisions of the sites anyway site is a legal binding convention but the kites convention itself says that it does not take the place of national law so that means you have any national law related to wildlife protection so it is not going to be an alternate so some of the sites provision or many sites provision was not included for example in the sites we have appendix 1 appendix 2 and all whether it is reflected in the wildlife protection act in the original act no not directly so in this way today now we want to uh, implement some of the provisions of the sites so that was included number 1 number 2 under this act now the central government is getting more power so how in the sense is now the central government under the new amendment bill the central government can create or designate management authority so this management authority only will grant all the imports and exports or any trade of a wildlife all wildlife specimen so management authority is a very important authority you can find the second is the central government will also have a power to regulate or to control to regulate or prohibit the trade 
or possession or any proliferation of invasive species invasive species or alien species now the central government will have a more power related to invasive species so that it can be a little <coughs> in line with your montreal uh, protocol that's not sorry montreal framework that is the quinning montreal framework so that uh, control of the invasive species will come under the uh, ambit of central government the third one is the central government will also have the power to declare or notify a conservation reserve so you know that protected when come to the protected area under the wildlife protection act we have national park wildlife sanctuary conservation reserve community reserve even tiger reserves also we have national park wildlife sanctuary can be created by any government state government can also create central government can also create but when come to conservation reserve community reserve it was included in 2003 amendment so it was said that it is only the most of the time it's the state government declare a conservation reserve community reserve so any any land adjacent to a national park or wildlife sanctuary i hope you know the basic provisions uh, under the new amendment uh, the conservation reserve can also be notified by the central government the next one is they are reducing the number of schedules now this is where lot of controversy comes so here in the original act actually we have six schedules you know schedule 1 schedule 2 is a high protected schedule 3 schedule 2 is a less protection schedule schedule 3 schedule 4 schedule 5 is a vermin category schedule 6 is a plants prohibited from cultivation some medicinal plant like cute plant pitcher plant vanda plant this is the original one now from the six schedules we are changing to in the new amendment they are changing to four schedule so schedule 1 it is <coughs> sorry it's a higher level of protection schedule 2 it is a lesser protection lesser degree of protection like certain nilgiris and all will come schedule 3 they brought a protected plant species mostly the pitcher plant cute plant medicinal plants and all will come that is you cannot cultivate those plant no one can cultivate the plant without the permission of a chief wildlife warden because his authority uh, the fourth schedule is being kept for appendixes that is sites appendixes so now we have made we have included some of the sites provision that is one and now vermin is removed completely so here they, uh, there is a lot of news that came during that period of time when this amendment bill was proposed even in down to earth and all it came they said it's a vermin politics so what is that vermin politics says normally vermin you know that vermin under the original act any wild uh, species that is nuisance to the wildlife so even sometime you know you can say bat crow everything come under and normally what the central government will do is if any state government request a particular species schedule 3 or schedule 4 species to put under a vermin category they will put it now the concept of vermin category is not there so does it mean that we are coming completely get rid away from get rid away from vermin no it's not like that the interpretation says the activist the wildlife activist for us activist says that now this is giving more power for the central government to declare any animal as a vermin category so that is what the interpretation says so here the procedure for declaring the vermin also becomes very easy because it is not under the any schedule so central government can declare any species as a vermin category so that is a concern we have in this the next one is control of sanctuaries by the chief wildlife warden which is already is given here and then if you want to register any live specimen of any scheduled species so that can be only done from a certificate from the management authority so which we have included in the provision so these are the some of the provision and apart from that suppose by chance anyone has any uh, species any captive animal or something they can come voluntary surrender to the chief wildlife warden chief wildlife warden is authority that's called voluntary surrender of captive animal uh, if you surrender voluntarily so compensation doll will not be paid so the the amendment says that there will not be any provision for compensation or anything nothing else and the next one important uh, uh, addition in this is they have given exemption for live elephant that is the bill allows for a commercial trade in the live elephant but if you see <coughs> previous act the original act it completely prohibits trade any sort of a trade in the wildlife but for especially in the captive and the wild elephants and all but here they have given a they have given a provision for allowing some of the trade here so especially then comes under the uh sanctuaries that is falling in the schedule area that is in the fifth schedule so they told that if uh, any sort of a sanctuary if it is going to fall in the scheduled area a proper management plan should be created 
so we have to oblige to the forest right act so in that line you have to get a uh, some sort of a concern from the gram sabha okay any sanctuaries that is falling under a scheduled area and penalties also they have increased it normal for general violation and all so the penalty from 25000 they increased to 1 lakh and for the specially protected animal they have increased from uh, 10000 to 25000 rupees so these are the some of the provisions they have increased they have done okay what are the issues with the thing so there are some few issues the first issue the parliamentary when this particular bill has went for the parliamentary committee the parliamentary committee headed by mr jayaram ramesh he told that so especially come to the elephants so that should be a very clear indication that it should the elephant should limit only to the temple elephants that is kept for religious purpose for other reasons and all you know the live elephants and all should not be traded so that is a one criticism was put under the second type of criticism vermin category so since vermin category was removed now it seems that the uh, the center will have a very easy hand on the vermin so they can declare anything as a vermin so they will uh, they no need any special procedure to declare a particular species as a vermin so that is that is another concern that was raised and at the same time the bill also severely curtail the grazing area across the pastoral spaces so by that way some of the uh, pastoral community like one gujars and all the tribal community they may get impacted so these are the some of the criticism that has been put on the wildlife protection act amendment bill of this 2022 the next one the next amendment bill is the biological diversity amendment bill of 2021 so we have a biological diversity act 2002 so we brought this act uh, in order to oblige the cbd convention since we have signed the cbd convention this act was created the purpose of the act is nothing but the purpose of the cbd convention so here uh if you come to the cbd convention once again if you come to the cbd convention so basically the convention objective is to convention objective or the biological diversity act objective is to conserve the biodiversity sustainable use of its component and the third one important is the fair and equitable sharing so for the fair and equitable sharing of genetic resources they brought one protocol that is something called nagio protocol i hope you know it so now this amendment bill what it tries to do so now we'll see so here it seems that we are trying to include some of the provisions of nagio Pro- nagio protocol so that means the changes in the bill some provisions of we cannot say all the provisions of nagio protocol some provisions of nagio protocol will be done so that is what gently they say that the reference to nagio protocol has been given to the biological diversity amendment bill so what are the major provision the first provision is they are exempting some of the oish practitioner and even the people <coughs> accessing the codified traditional knowledge from the prior intimation of state biodiversity board so you know that the original act says that there will be three level of organization nba sba bmc i hope you know that national biodiversity authority state biodiversity board and uh, state biodiversity board and the biodiversity management committee local level central government state government local government so normally any foreigner and all if they want access they have to come to the nba any indian uh, any indian or indian company when they want to do an access research or something they have to come and ask for the sbb and uh, uh, anyone you want you or me a common man wants to take any research no need for any permission so here now what they have done is anyone who do oish practitioner or one who have an access to a codified traditional knowledge some of the oish also will have it they don't need to do any they don't need to give any prior intimation to the state biodiversity board for accessing biological resources so by that way what we try to do what they try to do is they try to open up the resources for more research and more exploitation so what is the codified traditional knowledge so that is very important so it is a uh, <coughs> it is given in a you know ipr intellectual property right even the who the world health organization what they say about codified traditional knowledge is that is uh, it is a sort of a traditional medicine that has been disclosed in the 
ancient scriptures so that should be a written one so for example if you take a ayurveda so ayurveda whether yes ayurveda it is written in sanskrit you can see and even some uh, chinese traditional medicine also it is written in their script and if you take ayurveda and all we have 44 authorized text we have approximately they say that authorized books we have even for siddha we have more than 29 authorized book for unani you know that there are more than 13 authorized book that is some, something which is written in a ancient scripture it should be in a written form that is something called codified traditional knowledge it is a system of medicine so for chinese medicine we have ayurveda siddha and all codified traditional knowledge suppose there are some medicine which you don't have a scripture you don't have a script or something you don't have a book an ancient sort of a book most of the time that come from uh, oral tradition from one generation to another generation you know the vedic <coughs> period and all how the vedas came from one generation to another generation by oral tradition suppose if it comes in the oral tradition that is something called non codified traditional knowledge so here we have only given for the codified traditional knowledge because we believe that codified traditional knowledge will have some some sort of a scientific relevance so especially like ayurveda and all so anyway ayush they are getting covered under it that is number one number two the bill is exempting all the cultivated medicinal plant from the purview of the act so earlier so if you want to <coughs> cultivate any medicinal plant and all it will be a, you need a permission and all now so they are exempting it so it is now free number three yes they want to fast track research because we want to go for a bio prospecting exploitation of biodiversity so as per the mego protocol so in order to fast track the research patent and all so fast track the research patent and all they have made some provisions in that that's the third one and the fourth very important is if you are doing any violation in the law <coughs> during the access of biological resources and all in the earlier act it was a criminal offense so jail imprisonment and all was there but now they are made into a civil offense that means it will go with a penalty so that means i can say that many people will easily enter into biodiversity research going for bio prospecting and also the fifth one is also they try to uh, improve some investments especially in the research especially in the research of the biodiversity so that's how uh, we want the foreign companies to come so foreign investment how they have made in the new amendment is the foreign investments yes foreigners can come but the one condition is they have to uh, necess they have to come along with the indian company especially for a biodiversity research but foreign entity approval should come only from the nba national biodiversity authority they are approved nba authority sorry nba approval is mandatory for the foreigners so this all in turn will going to boost your indian system of medicines and also it is going to fast track your research patent and other thing and uh, at the same time it will also give a boost for the farmers to cultivate the medicinal plants so that also is because it's exempting medicinal plant from the cultivation so these are sorry <coughs> these are the some of the provisions they have made okay so what some criticism we have so what are the major criticism what we have is so first thing is uh, some of the activist they believe they see this as something this amendment bill is more of a economic oriented something like you know trade and other thing but the core object of our convention on biological diversity or the biological diversity act is to conserve biodiversity conserve biodiversity sustainably exploit it but rather than conserving biodiversity they believe that this changes and all is going to lead to unsustainable exploitation of biodiversity second is now we are opening up more for exemption of codified traditional knowledge ayush and all there could be a possibility of bio piracy okay because without a prior intimation they do it immediately they come and take a patent and all so then bio piracy can happen the third one important provision is uh, if you see the total uh, total amendment in that the bmc so earlier if they want to <coughs> do a research or any sort of exploitation the nba sba will consult the bmc and then only they will do it but in the new provision it seems that the sba the sbb that is state biodiversity board itself can you know represent bmc in order to uh, determine the benefit sharing agreement so that means bmc has been marginalized so that is a third uh, criticism comes and the fourth one is side leading the local community so here when we try to say that for certain for certain large companies and all they are giving a prior approval for sharing the benefit now when they go when you allow of cultivation and all 
we cannot ensure that the local people will be involved so sometime massive cultivation of medicinal plant will happen local people may be there but benefit sharing may not also happen so that possibility is also is a uh, criticism which has been highlighted by the conservation activist okay so that is about the biological diversity act and they have given a reference to the nagio protocol the next one come to the biodiversity forest we have brought a forest conservation rules forest conservation rules so it is coming out of the forest conservation act you know the forest conservation act basic idea is to uh, the main idea of forest conservation act uh, any forest land when it is diverted for non forest purpose it should get a the state government should get a prior approval from the central government so the, the fundamental is otherwise the state government for the purpose of revenue generation they may they may divert the forest land for some non forest purpose like plantation farm plantation something so because of that the biodiversity will decline the forest cover may also decline so that is the reason any forest land when it is diverted for any non forest purpose prior approval of the central government is needed so here under that in 2003 they brought a forest conservation rule now that rules they are doing amendment that is called the forest conservation rules of 2022 okay what are the changes they have done in this rule the first thing is they brought or they formed certain committee so the first committee it is called advisory committee this advisory committee so any any forest land diversion so advisory committee it will be created by the central government uh, it may contain around 6 members and uh, it will meet for every one, every month so most of the time it is the advisory committee only they will grant approval for forest land diverting for non forest purpose okay <clears throat> so it's come to the scope of central government the second is they will form a another committee regional empowered committee so this regional empowered committee it is also created by the central government so two times a month they will meet most of the time they are the one who will examine the project so normally first we have to examine what type of project is going to come so whether for that project it is worth to divert the forest land for non forest purpose that we need to see for examining the project proposal and all so actually for the project they are the one our regional uh, empowered committee is created then the third one is project screening committee project screening committee it is created by state government it is created by state government so they are the one who will advise they are the one who will advise for the proposal of the project okay they just propose it regional advisory committee only will examine it finally grant will be given by the advisory committee so they brought a three uh, like a three committees three structures okay so normally project screening committee uh, they will generally do it uh, for all the project except Uh, the project that comes in the uh, comes in less than five hectares, so that's a standard they have given it. Okay, now, so what they say under this forest conservation rule? So first thing is compensatory afforestation. So you know that when a forest land is acquired by any corporate or government organization, they have to pay a compensation. So that compensation money, how to be used, that is given in the Compa Act. now normally that compensation money what they can do is they can do afforestation normally that is a fundamental idea you get a money you take a land you give the money that money go for the compensation now comp sorry the money go for the afforestation so coming to the afforestation so what is the rule says is suppose if any corporate is taking corporate or any agency is taking a forest land now they want to, it is their liability to do afforestation suppose if it is something a forest land is taken from a hill or mountain range so what the uh, mountain range that covers two third of its geographical area so you are taking a mountain or any hill range so you are taking a area which is two third of the geographical area or probably one third of its uh, sorry if it's a state or union territory if it has one third of its geographical area then what you can do is that compensatory afforestation no need that you have to do it in that place you can also do it in some other place some other state or some other union territory where the cover is less than 20 percentage so simple you are going to do in himachal pradesh let me say that the himachal pradesh has got a the particular area has got two third of the areas coming under the 
uh, forest region. So then you can also propose an Andhra Pradesh. Suppose assuming that Andhra Pradesh or some other state has 20% less than, uh, less than it, in some other place also, you can do afforestation. So that is one. So you don't want to do afforestation in that state. That's what it implies. Number two, it is also allowing private plantation. So let me come, let me give an example. Suppose uh, we will allow, the state government will allow the private to acquire a land and do a plantation. Suppose a corporate takes some other land, some other forest land, they want to do afforestation. Uh, now what they can do is they come to the private land, they come to the private man, they can pay the money, they can get that afforestated land. So that is what allow private plantation. The rules make a provision for private parties to cultivate plantation and sell them to a land, sell them that land to company who need to meet compensatory afforestation target. Okay, so that is also allowed. So in this, <coughs> then <coughs> the third one is no need for, no consent of Gram Shabha needed. So here, this is a, one of the biggest uh, thing that happens. Now, the Forest Conservation Act, the Forest Conservation Rule says that if they have decided to acquire any forest land, so whether you need to get approval from the forest, normally as per the present procedure, any acquisition of a forest land, we have stage one clearance, stage two clearance. So normally before the stage one clearance itself, they will get a consent from the Gram Shabha. Then only the acquisition and all will happen. But the new procedure says that no need to get a clearance Stage one, even in the stage two, after stage two clearance, you can get a consent from the Gram Shabha, okay, if needed. So that is a, another provision they brought. That means that is something they are diluting the Gram Shabha. That is what the meaning it implies. Then apart from that, the forest conservation rules also says that you can also allow building in forest. So especially structures and all, uh, for uh, structures related to the forest protection, related to the forest protection and residential unit up to 250 square meters, it is allowed as a relaxation, it will be allowed. So these are the some of the major changes they are doing in the forest conservation. So rules so that they want to, <coughs> you know, they want to ease that forest land diverting for non-forest purpose, if it is needed for development activity and all. So what is the criticism, major criticism? So there is only one criticism. Uh, once this particular rules was brought, uh, the National Commission of Tribal Affairs they have sent a notice to a Ministry of Environment stating that it is diluting the Forest Right Act. So it is violating the Forest Right Act. Because no need of no consent from Gram Shabha. But anyway, <coughs> uh, they say that uh, the particular Commission on Tribal Affairs says that, so the recognition of right actually should happen before stage one, at least after stage two, at least you should have, but it's completely removing the provision. So for that, the Ministry of Environment says, anyway, if you take a land, anyway, the land is taken or any project is cleared after the land acquisition. So uh, even in the Forest Right Act or you take Indian Forest Act. So in that, if a land is taken, most of the time, say they will appoint a settlement officer for a settlement officer, claims and all, they will do it. After that only, they go for clearance and all. So they say that it is not going to impact this Forest Right Act. So this particular Forest Conservation Act or the particular, the Forest Right Act, it is something, a parallel process. So it's not going to affect it. Anyway, we are going to pay the compensation. If a land is just like that, we are not going to take a land. We are going to take a land by paying the compensation. So why unnecessary need of concern from the Gram Shabha? So that is their stand. We are going to pay a compensation. We are going to take the land. So that and all is going to be done. After that only, we are going for a clearance and all. So in this way, so why there should be a need for Gram Shabha? So that is a uh, argument that has been put by the Ministry of Environment. So that is a one criticism that has happened. So local people participation seems to be uh, negated in this uh, particular forest conservation rules. Okay, there is one. The next is this year, we brought a forest conservation amendment bill. So in the FCA Act itself, we are bringing an amendment. So what are the major, <coughs> I'm sorry, major amendment is they want certain activities. So the same way, uh, forest land, when it is diverted for non-forest purpose, we want some of the, uh, uh, we want the concern from the central government. 
So here, the central government wants to give relaxation for certain projects. Certain project, they don't want the uh, clearance from the central government. So what are the different types of project? We'll directly go for the type of project which has been given. So the one is ecotourism. So relaxation has been given to ecotourism. The second is zoos and safaris. The third one is silvicultural, silvicultural activity for that is forest development activities and all. And if you want to bring any land situated, suppose land situated 100 kilometer along international borders. Because sometimes there is a possibility that they can give you some list. They can ask you under the Forest Conservation Amendment Bill, which are all exempted. So for the purpose of uh, national security, if it is a land situated 100 kilometer along the international border, so directly you can take no need for prior approval from the central government. And also security related infrastructures. Security related infrastructures, even defense related. Defense related and public utility project public utility project obviously central government that is proposed by anything central government brings public utility project and also when come to the <coughs> sorry infrastructure project rail line rail line or any sort of a public road but the condition is it should be less than one hectare of land. Because rail line and all, you're not going to take a very big land. So if it is less than one hec point one hectare of land, okay. so for this and all, so exemption has been given. So no need for a permission, prior approval is not needed. So main idea is, especially for the defense related projects and especially infrastructure projects and all, uh, the government related project is getting delayed because of the clearance, because it has to come to the, from state government, it has to come to the central government. So it has to come to the Ministry of Environment. There is a section, so it will take more time. So they don't want a delay in this project. So this project has to move smooth. So for that reason, they brought this amendment bill. Anyway, so the only concern is, uh, uh, so, sometimes there is a possibility of exploitation in the ecotourism. Even some of the forest under government record will also get exploited. So, that is also another concern we have in this forest amendment bill, Conservation Act amendment bill. Okay. So, the next one is community forest right. So, community forest right, it comes under the section 3 of the Forest Right Act. That is a scheduled tribes and the traditional dwellers recognition of rights act. So here we are exclusively recognizing rights. If you take a forest right act, so we have four types of rights they have. The one is the ownership right. We have a, a, a use right. That is they can take minor forest produce and all. They have a relief right. By chance you are taking their land, you can you have to pay a compensation. And then forest management right. So I can say that the fourth right is something Forest management right, it comes under the, that, 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 that is what in the form of a CFR, community forest right. So what is the major news is, so here, the first state to give a community forest right under the section three is Odisha, Shimli Pal. In the Shimli Pal, they have given it. The next one comes the Chhattisgarh. In the Chhattisgarh, Kang, there is a national park, Kangar Gati National Park. The Kangar Gati National Park is a second protected area, Chhattisgarh has got the uh, community forest right. So what is the provision? So first thing, it's a, uh, it is a normally a forest land that has been traditionally protected by the tribal people or community people. So that is something, that type of land only, we provide a community forest right. The main thing is, it can, the very important is, it can be any type of land. So whether it can be a national park, reserve forest, tiger reserve, does not matter. You have to provide the right. Community forest right will be applicable there. 
so no restriction so whether if it is a national park or wildlife sanctuary no there is no restriction at all any land can be any forest land reserve forest whichever forest it can be brought okay now once the community forest right is given so they can have a rights on the non timber forest produce and all they can ensure the sustainable livelihood and more important is the gram sabha will have more power so that is the ownership of the forest land will go to the gram sabha instead of the forest department so that is a very important provision so controlling it and all management of that creating a management plan so how to formulate rules everything will be done by the community so that means it allows the community to formulate the rules and regulation and the gram sabha will become the nodal body so that is very important gram sabha will become the nodal body for the for the management of the particular forest and the one important thing is the gram sabha what they can do is they can also adopt some of the local traditional practices for the conservation there is something called traditional knowledge we call it as so they are they are living with the forest for a long period of time so they were in harmony with the forest this tribal people or traditional dweller so they can use the traditional method they can also use the traditional knowledge for the conservation and management of that particular forest so that is a uh, aim of the community forest resource right so cfr so or we can also called as a cfr okay. so first one was the odisha the second is the thangargati that is there the next there was a news about the <coughs> eco sensitive zone uh, so according to the wildlife action plan so the ministry of environment has stipulated that every state government they have to declare 10 km surrounding a national park or wildlife sanctuary as a ecological sensitive zone under the environment protection act of 1986 so basically this is uh, based on the supreme court judgment some few years back so supreme court told that if you have a national park or wildlife sanctuary 10 km you have to minimum 10 km you try to declare suppose if it is a very economy oh, sorry if it is a ecologically very fragile zone the central government can also declare more than 10 km also but possibly 10 km you have to declare so once you declare as a ecological sensitive zone so here what are the activities will be prohibited what are the activities are permitted or regulated prohibited some of the major commercial mining and all is completely prohibited even saw mills and all the industry anything causes pollution will be prohibited so for a pollution in the sense air pollution water pollution or noise pollution and major hydroelectricity projects also will be prohibited and also commercial use of the uh, wood exploitation is also prohibited so this and all prohibited what and all regulated is felling of tree cutting of tree so here the forest department will control so how much trees to be cut so felling of trees will be regulated they will allow some hotels and resorts and all for developing tourism for local income local people development so that will be regulated natural water commercial use will be regulated and apart from that certain electric cables some of the basic infrastructures and all widening of roads even for some changes in agriculture and all that and all they will regulate it and what they will permit it so permitted activity so any ongoing agriculture activity horticulture activity that will be <coughs> sorry permitted rain water harvesting organic farming and the use of renewable energy sources and adoption of any uh, green technology that and all will be permitted if you declare as a ecological sensitive zone so here uh, why we need to create it basically we are trying to control the man animal conflict that's a major one so here we want to minimize the impact of development activity so that is the first thing second is we want to better improve the insight to conservation because national park wildlife sanctuary tiger reserve so all are some sort of a insight to conservation so you have a buffer zone it is going to be like a shock observer zone by that way better the particular zone will be conserved and at the same time forest depletion also is conserved and more important is it's going to be a smooth transition so you have a national park or wildlife sanctuary nearby you have a village or you have a town so you can see a huge human activity a completely a secluded forest so it will be going to be nearby so when you have a forest region where you have a buffer zone so the transition between the risky to the low risky 
so urban area or sorry any sort of a town is a risky area so that risky to low risky the transition also is going to be smooth for that reason only they brought it that is what the supreme court has brought this particular gave a judgment related to the ecological zone now what is the issue we had last year i hope you know that kerala <coughs> more than 10 protected area in the kerala they are not able to create a ecological sensitive zone because according to the uh, the ministry rules or even to the supreme court judgment 10 km at least 10 km you have to create a ecological sensitive zone like a buffer zone or shock absorber zone but it seems that in kerala many protected area 10 km they are not able to give it so what the kerala uh, the kerala government is justifying is the kerala the remote sensing environment center says that approximately 29 percentage or 30 percent of the kerala the state comes and falls in the ecological sensitive zone so that is very difficult where you have lot of residential building commercial buildings and all and almost it is reported that more than 115 villages with a lot of tribal settlement more than 83 to 80 to 85 tribal settlement falls in the ecological sensitive zone so such a massive displacement of people so definitely it will create more trouble in the state second is copying such a compensation also will have more burden for the state government and also the state government uh, says that as per the 2011 census if you see uh, the number of people it is going to be 860 people per square kilometer so if you see population wise so that means it is twice the population density in the country the population density is also more so in that sense creating such a 10 kilometer of ecological sensitive zone where more people are there where to shift the people shift such a huge amount of people is also very very difficult so that is the reason at one point of time supreme court told that just give 1 km even for that 1 km also they say that it is not possible for that itself we have to you know vacate many number of people so where it is not possible lot of chaos will happen compensation paying compensation resettlement rehabilitation appointing a settlement officer doing that activity itself becomes very very difficult so that's the reason the issue is going with the ecological sensitive zone the protest is going happening in the kerala regarding the ecological sensitive zone okay the next we'll come to the next forestry so here <coughs> we have one of a very important forestry congress that is last year it is a 15th world forestry congress that happened in the seol so it's called seol declaration so here more than 141 countries have participated so this uh, world forestry congress it was uh, mostly it is it is done in the auspice of uh, united nation fao food and agriculture organization so normally it happens for every 6 year once every 6 year once because it's one of a very important uh, congress and one of the important report there is a report called state of world forest report so last year the 2022 state of world forest report was released okay so what in this declaration first we we'll, first we will see what has happened in this declaration then we will see what is the report says we will see only the major key finding of the report so in the forest congress forestry congress uh, all the countries first they discuss about the investment in the forest so they they are planning to they say they Uh, they took a resolution that we have to triple the investment in the forest then only there is something a green investment we have to do so improving the forest cover or better sustainable use of forest so by that way we will be able to reach many target for example in the convention in the cbd convention we have 13 to 30 so if you want to reach the target even if you want to mitigate a climate change even land degradation so we have one bone convention so there are also 350 million hectares of uh, deforested land we have to we have to restore it so if you want to achieve all this target at least we have to even for climate change mitigation and all we have to increase the investment into three times in the forest forest and the landscape for the restoration that is number 1 number 2 the congress also decided to move towards circular bio economy so circular economy you know that it is something we have to you know reuse and recycle it so ensure that the reuse and recycle happens in a cyclic manner it should not happen in a linear manner so it's called circular bio economy and also to achieve the climate neutrality because that is uh, one of the biggest threat for the forest resources 
and the third one is we have to make a healthy forest because many pandemics are connected to the forest forest and forest loss so in future this uh, seol declaration this world forestry congress says that food and agriculture organization says that more pandemic is going to happen because of the forest loss so controlling the pandemic controlling the forest loss and improving the forest will reduce the pandemic so these are the uh, major one in related to the forest and also human health so for this so two sort of uh, a plan initiative they brought the one is called affirm so affirm is nothing but it is a, a risk management plan so what is the risk management plan is uh, it is something we can take example from other countries see every country has a has their own forest management i'm right so some countries they do better management so two things when you want to improve the forest when you want to manage a forest protect the forest so you have to invest more money either investment in form of money or investment in form of ideas so two things are there so some countries even without investing more money through ideas through better uh, practices they can also they also conserve so the affirm initiative is all about what we need to do is we need to bring all the ideas together and also so that when you bring all the ideas by that way we can understand what are all the risk associated with the forest and how to improve the forest so that is something called affirm that's called assuring the future of forest with integrated risk management that is number 1 number 2 is about safe initiative so what are the safe initiative sustaining on abundance of forest ecosystem sometimes they can ask you in one word safe initiative is related to what so world bank fao so just keep in mind affirm safe safe initiative is nothing but to increase the capacity building so as of now investment in forest today under the climate change one of the biggest investment is going to come through the red plus program so you know the red and red plus program so through the red plus program we have to further develop the red plus program and we have to increase the capacity building of the red plus program red plus program is nothing but the rich country is funding the developing country and poor country to conserve the forest so here we are predicting in the near future another 20 30 years of time there are going to be a big carbon market because of the forest so they are going to the rich country is going to give many billion dollars we are expecting many billion dollars or million of euros will be moving from rich country to developing country or poor country to conserve the forest because as of now for every 5 second a, a football ground size of a forest is being cut tropical forest is cut so when the forest is cut lot of carbon dioxide trapped carbon dioxide from the soil is emitted at the same time carbon sequestration is also controlled so the only way is to stop the cutting of forest so that for that the rich country is transferring money to the developing country or poor country to stop the cutting of the forest so that is something called red initiative so here under the safe initiative they want to improve the capacity of red plus so that better forest conservation can happen this is a two important sort of initiative they have taken now come to the report so what the report says we will see only the key finding of the reports see this report is very essential because in the last conference of party 26 uh, the countries have, uh, in the glasgow that is conference of party 26 of un of triple c in the glasgow they have taken a glasgow leaders declaration on forest and land use more than 140 countries have pledged that by 2030 they will completely eliminate forest loss they will stop deforestation but india did in sign this particular thing because we feel that this declaration is something connecting to trade so anything connecting to trade we don't want climate change and trade to come together trade means we want only we want that to be discussed only in the world trade organization so anything connecting trade and climate change we don't want because of climate change the trade is affected so our economy will get affected so in that sense only we didn't sign the certain declaration even during the glasgow also there is a fact dialogue that also we didn't sign so here uh, globally many 140 countries have signed this glasgow declaration so the state of forest world forest report is something very important for the glass glasgow leadership declaration so in what way is first thing this report is published biannually and this is one of the most important uh, you know report for forest it's a most important i can say stock take on the forest ecosystem so what this report says finding alone we will directly see so first thing is key finding it seems that between 1990 to 2020 so in a 20 years period that's a key key crucial period where a lot of development took place you know that after 1991 and all india lpg liberalization program and all many countries liberalization and all happened 
So in this period, more than 420 million hectares of forest land has been deforested. But actually what we have is only 4.06 billion forest land. This is a hectare of forest land we have. But in this 20 years of period, we can see 420 million hectares of land we have lost. So just you can imagine. The second is the rate of deforestation. So whether it is increasing or declining between 2015, you know that from 2015 Paris Agreement and all came. So anyway, the consciousness from 2010-15 onwards, deforestation rate has declined. So the rate of deforestation, it is declining. Okay, but we have lost more than 10 million hectare of forest every year between 2015 to 2020. So comparing with previous previous period, anyway the deforestation rate is declining. But every year we are at least losing 10 million hectare. The second is it is projected that this report projects between 2015, that is 2016 to 2015, we may lose anywhere around 289 million hectare of forest. So you see that 289, despite of taking many measures, because under the Paris Agreement, we are bringing many Red Plus program, we have taken a Glasgow declaration and all. Despite of that, it is predicted that. 289 or 290 million hectares of forest, forest cover or forest will be deforested between 2016 to 2015, especially in the tropical country alone. That is what he says. Say. Within the tropical country alone, we are going to, that itself will result in 169 giga ton of carbon dioxide emission. Suppose if you don't take action. So that is another one. And the last one important thing is infectious disease. It seems that if you take a infectious disease, 250 infectious disease, we have approximately emerging infectious disease related to forest. Uh, 15, sorry, uh, infectious disease we have. In that 15% of the emerging diseases comes or linked with forest. So especially COVID-19 and all, COVID-19 or drug resistant infections, even Zika virus and uh, anything that is reported from 1960s, some or other way we can attribute to deforestation and land use. So that is what the world report says, forest report says. So they say that we have to control the forest. Uh, that is, we have to control the deforestation. So that is a key finding of this report. The another one, it's connected to poverty. So, uh, that is one. And next one is very important, GDP dependence. So how much percentage of GDP is dependent to forest? So forest in general, they, they don't say in terms of forest, they say that at least 50% of the world GDP, 50% of the world GDP, some or other way, it is tied up with ecosystem services. So we have four different types of services, I'm right? Provisioning services, uh, the regulating services, supporting services, and cultural services. So if you calculate, more than 50% is directly or indirectly dependent on the ecosystem services. So in that forest plays a very important role. So that is what this report says. These are the key findings, at least the key finding alone, you can have a look at it. Okay, now we will come to some ocean and water. So ocean and water, there are many uh, many reports and all was there, but some of the important report alone, we will take it. The first one is the UN United Nation Ocean Conference 2022 that has happened last year. So this conference is a, a conference related to ocean ecosystem. Uh, it was co-hosted by government of Kenya and Portugal. It was co-hosted by government of Kenya and Portugal. Uh, from the Indian side, the Ministry of uh, Science, Earth Sciences has led the delegation. So in this conference, India, the Science and Technology Ministry has uh, given a, has a provider, has promised that we will provide science and uh, innovation based solution, especially for the, you know, marine, uh, marine related technology related to ocean exploration and all. So that type of technology, the Ministry of Earth Sciences, the Ministry of Earth Sciences has given a commitment. So anyway, this ocean conference is in line with our sustainable development goal because we are all working for SDG 2030, am I right? 17 sustainable development goal. So in this, if you take SDG 14, life below water. Life below water, that's a SDG 14. 
so it's nothing but related to the uh, marine technology and marine and ocean marine diversity so this conference is directly related to the sdg 14 okay now we will see uh, what is the key discussion that has happened the first thing they acknowledge the triple threat of climate change so to the ocean see climate change how it is okay. impacting the ocean if you see when the temperature increases first thing the ocean becomes very warm you know the ocean temperature changes the marine biodiversity pattern is also changing the second is when the thermal pollution is increasing when the temperature is increasing the dissolved oxygen level will reduce am i right so the devo level reduces so that's the second threat the third one is when the when when the carbon dioxide increases you know that most of the carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean 70 75% is the ocean so by that way the ocean acidification also also happening it is becoming more acidic so this is what triple threat so warming carbon dioxide increase ocean acidification and the third one is about the oxygen level is reducing so what is the consequence you know that when the warming happens the water expands sea level rise happens second is when the carbon dioxide goes and dissolves it will acidity increases coral bleaching is happening and the temperature increases acidity changes you can see the algae pattern will change some of the phytoplankton some bad diatom bad dinoflagellate will flourish so that will result in harmful algae bloom red tides and all so that's another problem when the oxygen level reduces you know marine many marine biodiversity will decline their habitat is lost diversity biodiversity loss is happening and at the same time the fishery resources is also getting declined so first thing they acknowledge the triple threat of the climate change because that is a very important one okay what are the outcomes so what they decided anyway they just it's a not a very legal binding they took some resolutions so first thing they decided to have a moratorium on the deep sea mining because you know for electronic industry a lot of rare earth minerals are needed so for the deep sea exploration is going on first and foremost that deep sea mining do a more damage to the ocean ecosystem so they want to put a moratorium second is they want to improve the ocean or the coastal ecosystem for carbon sequestration so it's nothing but a blue carbon so you know that mangroves if you take a mangrove promoting mangrove is one important aspect because mangrove soil contains two to three times more carbon than the tropical forest because the soil organic carbon in mangrove is very high the second one you take a sea grass bed so today they say that for a climate change mitigation sea grass bed coastal ecosystem plays a very important role because sea grass capture 35 times more carbon dioxide than the tropical rainforest so in that way even promoting the coral beds so if you take any coastal ecosystem marine coastal ecosystem that is something a very good carbon sequestration at the same time it also improves the biodiversity so that is number one then blue deal it is nothing but sustainable exploitation anyway so without economy we cannot survive so anything you conserve you should have some sort of a sustainable exploitation so in this they call it as a blue deal so what is a blue deal is we have to use the ocean resource for economic growth especially sustainable way so in that way trade investments and all okay for a resilient ocean economy you have to do it and then there was also talk on the high seas anyway we will see one separate topic on high seas see today the high seas is not regulated anyway right now we have one agreement one sort of a legal binding is going to come bbnj we will see now under the un clause so some talk on the unregulated high seas because there is no comprehensive framework legal framework we have the high seas that's that discussion went on the last one is they want to they also discuss about the triple threat of the ocean they want to control the ocean pollution apart from that very important pollution is a plastic pollution apart from general pollution or global warming marine acidification and all plastic pollution lot of plastic waste because by 2050 billion tons of plastics is going to be from the ocean and at the same time microplastic so that's a second concern we have so that also they had a discussion so that's one conference related to the thing okay now the next one is 
UN Treaty on High Seas. Once again. UN Treaty on High Seas. Okay. So first thing, what is territorial water? So if we take a country, every country will have an exclusive economic zone. That is their territorial water. For example, from the country land, uh, anywhere around 200 nautical mile. So approximately 370 kilometer from the coastline, it is considered as a territorial waters. So they have a complete jurisdiction on the living and the non-living resources. So beyond that, we call it as a high sea. So here, no country is responsible for the protection and management of the high seas. So in this line, in around eight, 1958, there was a Geneva Convention on High Seas. So in that, they said that it is not included in the territorial water. So that is what it said, but a concrete resolution was not there. And then 1982, we have a UN clause. So I hope you would have heard about the United Nations Convention on Law of Sea. So that was assigned. So even in that, so basically they talk about high seas, but there is no clear or comprehensive legal framework for high seas. So there is no, so it is not, it's a something global common. It's not directly related to anyone. So no one will have a control or any sort of a uh, uh, legal authority over the high sea. But the concern is climate change. Now when the climate change, global warming, when it is increasing, so in that time, the marine biodiversity is affecting, high seas is getting affected. So that is the reason today, definitely we need to have some sort of a control on the high sea. Second thing, they want to exploit the resource. That is also another important thing because high seas has got more than 70%, 60, 65% of land that comes to the soil. The surface area comes out of the high sea. So that is the reason they want. So in 2015, in the United Nations General Assembly, okay, they have developed a, they have, they have planned to develop a legal instrument for the high seas under the UN clause. So for that, they created one IGC, Intergovernmental Conference. So to create a legal instrument on the high seas, it is something they created one uh, talk. So agreement, were, agreement is done, but it's not fully uh, completed. It is something called biodiversity of area beyond national jurisdiction. That is called BBNJ. So that is beyond the territorial water, diversity, whatever we have. So there we need to bring some sort of a legal agreement. That IGC, Intergovernmental Conference, in the talk only, this marine biodiversity of area beyond national jurisdiction, BBNJ, it was created. So recently in the New York, the discussion took place. The treaty is yet to formally adopt. So the members are, uh, but it's a legal binding treaty. The members are yet to ratify it. So once it is ratified, it's going to be a, the BBNG is going to be a legal binding treaty under the UN clause. So, okay. Why high seas? So first thing, more than 60, as I told you, you know, 60% of the ocean area. So it is a no man's land, no man's land. So it is something off of the earth surface area. So where you have a huge diversity resources. So right now it is not under the control of anyone. So we don't want anyone to take a direct control of it. And also more than 2.11 lakh species are in the high seas. And uh, it's a very important for the planetary regulation basically. And at the same time, there is a biggest ocean wealth we have. So in terms of raw material, genetic medicinal resources. So in all the aspects, you have different types of ecosystem services is done by the high seas. So that's the reason we want the BBNJ, a legal binding treaty to come. So, okay, what the, suppose if this legal binding is ratified. So what and all the basic provisions you will find, what are the key features you will find? The first thing is access and benefit sharing. So here they will form a committee, access and benefit sharing committee. So now the committee will decide how the benefits are how the access should be given to a country to exploit the resources, to maintain it. At the same time, how the benefit will be shared to everyone. So here, no single country can have exclusive right. 
So through them, through the committee only, the access will be given, and the benefit sharing agreement also will be done based on that. So and most of the time, we have to ensure that whatever the country do activity in the high sea, it should be peaceful related activity. So that committee will ensure it. That is number one. Number two, environment impact assessment. Suppose a country, any country is doing some sort of activity on a high sea, any exploitation or anything. They have before the activity they start, they have to conduct a EAA, sort of an environment impact assessment. So like the same thing, like a screening, scoping, and all should be done. And they have to prepare like a environment management plan. So how it is going to likely affect how the preservation will be done. So that and all should be uh, assessed or that should be done. That's a sort of a EAA should be conducted. Then suppose if the particular region is comes near a, any indigenous people, so here the resource sharing to the indigenous community should happen. Sometimes uh, it can be island or whichever it may be. So that marine resources, so the state, whichever the state is exploiting, they have to uh, equitably share with the genetic resources or something to the local community. That also we have to ensure. So no state can climb its jurisdiction at all. Then the next one, we will be having a clearing, clearing house mechanism. So the clearing house mechanism is nothing but, so if uh, anyone want to do a research or something, so first thing, they have to come through a clearing house mechanism. So they are the one who gives approval and other thing. And at the same time, they will create a fund. So under this, uh, they will create a conference of party and all. So in that funding will be done so that how the funding will be used for the uh, conservation of that high sea and also sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable exploitation of the high seas. So this will also support our 30 by 30 target. The CBD convention card, 30 by 30 target also, it will support. So because it's also because 30% of the ocean should be covered because already we have one submit called one planet submit and we had a one ocean submit. So in that itself, we decided 30 by 30, 30% of the land and 30% of the ocean should be conserved by 2030. So this uh, UN treaty on high seas will also be in line with the, the older one planet submit or one ocean submit. You can see that high ambition coalition. So India also joined this. So first thing for this, uh, some of the developed country, because you know that during the COVID period and all, we couldn't take any action. So at uh, uh, 2022, that is last year, February itself, there was one, one ocean summit was happened. So that time itself, some of the rich countries has proposed one coalition that is called high ambition coalition on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, BBNJ. So to principally, they want the countries to come and accept it so that later point of time, we can bring as a legal binding under the UN clause. So one version submit. So in that time itself, India has gave a proposal. India has accepted that high ambition coalition, and we have joined that high ambition coalition. Okay, for the thing. So these are the something about. So we'll just uh, we will have uh, just a five minutes of a break, and then we'll go to the next water conference. Just two to three minutes.
Okay, we'll start. So related to water, so we have uh, two reports. So two are very important report. One is by the United Nation and the one of the other by the United Nation organization, uh, that is WMO. So first thing is United Nation 2023 Water Conference. So it happened recently in the March, month of March. So this is a, uh, it's a conference that has happened after 46 years. They brought this conference. Uh, it was co-hosted in New York only it happened. It was co-hosted by the government of Tajikistan and uh, Netherlands. So the first conference, it was supposed that is the last, you cannot say it's first conference. The last conference has happened in 1977 in Argentina. So that time uh, in 1977, they took a global action plan. So related to water for safe drinking of water for everyone. Because every year we are getting one question or sometime one question related to water, groundwater, something we'll get it. So, uh, so 1977 after that, so now in 2023, we created this, we have brought this conference. So what is the reason for it? The reason is uh, we got a report that is something called uh, sort of a report, Water for Sustainable Development, 2018 to 2028. A UN-based report it came. In that report, it was told that the United Nation, the United Nation realized that, recognized that, the countries are not doing much effort or not taking much effort to meet water related demands. That is nothing but sustainable development goal six. So it's related to water. It is a something, you know, it is a water uh, for drinking water for everyone. So re regarding the clean water and sanitation for everyone by 2030, for that, the countries are not working. So if you go by it, so definitely clean water and sanitation for everyone by 2030 cannot be achieved. So that is the reason they brought this particular uh, conference again. So here the conference theme is our watershed moment, uniting the world for water. So that is the thing. So again, it is to support the 2030 agenda. At least we have to take some drastic action from 2023 to the next uh, 2030 to achieve the, our sustainable development goal six. Anyway, here we have brought water action agenda. So sometimes we can ask you what action agenda is related to what? It is related to UN conference 2023. Uh, anyway, no legal binding commitment for it. Okay, so what and all the decisions they have taken. So some of the major decision alone we can see. So first is they have taken a water action agenda. So this water action agenda is a little large one. So more than 713 voluntary commitment came from many governments, philanthropic philanthropic NGOs, corporation, corporates and all. So more than 713 different organization have come together and created this water action agenda. So under this uh, first one, they said they will support technology because today we have a special innovation or probably specific innovation in wastewater management treatment, solar treatment of water, so those technologies and all is not accessible. It's a present in some of the rich country in some developing country, but it is not accessible to the remote area and poor country. So in terms of technology, they will try to share. That is number one. Number two, so the World Meteorological Organization has committed that they will try to give some cost effective data and modeling for especially through sensors or through satellites for data analysis of water. So that where the water is more, where the water is less, water related management, for that we need to do some data collection. For that the WMO has given a commitment to provide uh, a sort of a data and model. The third one is the UNESCO has developed on platform, W12 plus blueprint. This platform, it is something, you know, to provide, uh, some of the case studies of various cities. You know that many cities have done better water management and water conservation. So those ideas and all will be put under this platform so that any cities or any government can take the idea from this platform for their water management. That's the third one. The fourth one is to have a capacity building for the water management, specifically water for women fund. So that's the fourth one they have established. So this is the one, this is a major outcome we can say. Apart from this, 
lot of initiative was taken that is many governments i think you can just have a glance of it no need to see it because many government has given a commitment during this conference for example usa has announced a commitment of 49 billion dollar for uh, climate resilient water and sanitation infrastructure even you can see the country japan has announced for a quality infrastructures so related to quality infrastructure related to water especially in the asian pacific region so vietnam has pledged for uh, cleaning of major river basins even african union also pledged that we will mobilize around 30 billion dollar by 2030 so like that european union has given a commitment so many initiatives was taken but what is more important in this conference is this conference water action agenda so that is a uh, three things the wmo data and modeling technological sharing and the w+12 blueprint platform these are the major initiatives or major decision was taken in this so that is one number two is there is an another small report from world meteorological organization that is called state of global water resource 2021 so this uh, is a first uh, report annual report Uh, this report is about the fresh water resources so what the world meteorological organization says is uh, or the report says the reports focuses on three area if you take a fresh water you know that one it will be in the stream the river system number two the terrestrial water storage like lakes dams and all the third one is a cryosphere the frozen one so these are the three areas where you have water so what they say about this three area the major finding is we are first and foremost thing in the all the three area the water is reducing so the water management is poor and second thing the world meteorological organization says it if you see from 2000 approximately 2001 to 2018 if you take what are all the natural disasters happened in the world most of the natural disaster more than 74% of the natural disaster is water related and the report very important is they say that approximately 3.6 billion people so today we have 8 billion people in the 3.6 approximately 50% of the people at least one month they have inadequate access to water and it is going to increase by 5 billion by 2050 so when you reach 2050 the population may also increase so we can assume that more than 50% of the population will have a inadequate access to water and also they told that because in the 2011 so comparatively drier than normal condition was very high because of the climate change and the la nina effect because the precipitation pattern and all has changed it so this is a major finding so specific to india what they told us the indus gangetic brahmaputra so that belt is suffering a lot so you can see that there is a more evidences to show that because of climate change global warming the indo gangetic plain is struggling a lot it can you can start from the indus even from the east pakistan to the northern india to southern nepal to the whole of bangladesh so there is a more impact on the water resource because of global warming so what is the finding is because of the glacial melt the water flow has increased but the total water storage in the region has declined so even though we can see that the glaciers are melting so the water flow should be increased yes the water flow is increasing doesn't mean that the water flow increase has result in good water storage no so that is poor basin management so water storage is declined despite of glacial melt and increase so this is going to have an extremely worrying effect of the igp because the igp itself has nearly half a billion people across the four countries so more population was residing in that belt so the belt is a very very uh, belt which is suffering a lot so related to the water resource that is a very key point in this report okay then we have some short news related to related to aquatic ecosystem and biodiversity shallow water mining so what is a shallow water mining is so any mining that takes uh, in a depth less than 200 meters we call this a shallow mining so generally they consider the shallow mining water mining is something uh, less destructive than terrestrial and also they consider this as a low cost and low cost low cost or low risk so right now it is underway in the norway uh, sorry namibia indonesia and also some new projects in new zealand sweden mexico and all is going on 
but in reality in a shallow water mining you will be removing large amount of sediments so you know that sediments and all because of the erosion process sediment comes so it takes a many years thousand of thousand of years to come a sediment to come and form where the benthic zone is created where lot of organism so when you disturb it many microbes and many benthic organism marine organism is getting affected and at the same time that is also resulting in spread of seabed material so when the seabed material increases sometime you can see the water will get more polluted and at the same time the marine environment is also affected so they consider it is not safe but generally people consider it as a very comparatively safe than the terrestrial mining and some of the species that was repeatedly coming in the news so one is about the red eared slider turtle so you can see the near the year it is red it's called a slider turtle so india if you take we have 29 freshwater turtle and tortoise species so if you take in the global level 365 356 turtles are there so in anyway worldwide 80% of them are threatened so in india also so threatened this is a invasive it's a non native so basically it is a native of uh, uh, south uh, america that is south eastern usa and mexico so as a pet and all they have been brought but once when they keep it as a pet as a small they will keep it when it becomes larger generally people go and put it in a lake or any other thing since it's a invasive it will do more damage most of the time if you see this habitat they can survive in the estuaries and coastal waters even in a brackish water they can survive even it can tolerate a, a difference in water quality even high pollutant level effluent also they can tolerate it's primarily aquatic Uh, but sometime it comes and bask on the land that is on the rocks and blocks so today it's in the least concern but now more numbers are increasing it is damaging the aquatic ecosystem okay then come to the marine protected area so india extended support so already in antarctica marine protected area in antarctica in antarctica we have two protected area the one is the south orkney island and the ross sea this is a two one we have So apart from this, some of the rich countries has proposed for another two marine protected area, East Antarctica and Weddell Sea. So India has supported it. So designating as a marine in 2021, and we have supported it. Okay, most of the time the marine protected area generally we will not allow much activity. First thing, the discharge of waste will be completely controlled and prohibited, and most of the time we will close the commercial fishing. so the european union has proposed this two region to be brought as a marine protected area so india has supported it okay dead zone so again it's coming in the news you know that in the process of eutrophication when more nutrients are entering into an any aquatic body whether it's a lake or whether it's a ocean so you can see after some point of time the biological oxygen demand decreases because algae die they go to the bottom bod decreases sorry bod in sorry bod increases and the do level decreases and after some point of time when the oxygen level is not there we call it as a dead zone it's also called as hypoxia reduced level of oxygen so the largest dead zone so it is now in arabian sea so which is covering in terms of uh, 63700 square mile okay the second largest is gulf of mexico which is covering around 6000 so now the largest dead zone in the world lies in the arabian sea so already they asked on this uh, eutrophication and uh, dead zone okay then we have some turtle the one is the northern river terrapin it is called batakur baska so batakur kachuga we saw sites we have introduced batakur kachuga so another one batakur baska northern river terrapin so it is also in the critically endangered basically it's a riverine turtle native to southeast asia so today it has come to critically endangered so it's found in bangladesh india sundarbans cambodia and all so why it has come to critically endangered basically because of high exploitation so hunting poaching of x uh, and poaching of uh, uh poaching of the particular turtle for meat even for medicinal and oil property so this particular river trap in northern river trap in is a omnivore has come to the critically endangered 
Then there was a news about Indian flap sh shell. It came in PAB. So the IUCN status wise is vulnerable. So it is in uh, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal and all. Most of the time it is found in the uh, waters, fresh waters of rivers, streams, lakes, ponds, irrigations and all. So normally they prefer to be in the mud waters, mud bottoms because of their tendency to borrow. So right now the status is uh, uh, vulnerable. So it's an omnivore. So why this flap shell is very important, conservation of flap shell is very important because they feed, they, they, they reduce the pollution level in the aquatic body. They have a very important role to produce the pollution in the aquatic ecosystem. Okay, now come to the pollution. So in the pollution, some conventional part we have discussed about, already we have discussed. So here, conventional part, uh, BS6 norms and uh, CAQM, Commission on Air Quality Management, and uh, the third one, National Clean Air Program. So these are the three conventional part already we discussed in the class. So there's three things you please raise it. There are chances that this year they can ask on CAQM. So anything now we will see in the pollution, what are the current affairs that has come. The first thing is National Clean Air Program. So here, the original plan of this National Clean Air Program, see, if you take NCAP, National Clean Air Program, Bharat State sits and all, we brought it after one report in 2019. 2019, from WHO and CCAC, we got a report called Air Quality Report. In that report only, they told, so the India pollution is very worst. So that is the reason we brought this Bharat State 6 and NCAP. So NCAP idea, original idea, is to reduce at least 20 to 30% of particulate matter. PM 2.5 and PM 10 by 2024. Because actually original plan is 2019 to 2024. It's a five year plan, original plan. But actually originally we are planning for 25 years because such a program, it is in China, which is very successful, which was which they claim to be successful. So that's the reason first we started with the five year National Clean Air Program. So to reduce at least 20 to 25 percent of, sorry, 20 to 30 percent of particulate matter, 2.5 and particulate matter 10 in 131 non-attainment cities. So actually the numbers was changing. So they said the numbers was earlier, they told that 43 small cities and one or two non-attainment city, then it came to 135, 132. So news comes in 132, 131, but the latest news what seems to be is 131 non-attainment city. So what is that non-attainment city? So these are the cities who fail to control their particulate matter, that is NAQS, the 12 pollutants, especially particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide in the last five years. So here we have done one small change. So from 20 to 30% reduction, the new target is 40% reduction by 2026. So earlier it is 20 to 30% reduction by 2024. Now it is 40% reduction by 2026. Okay, so we have little extended it. So that is updated one for 131 non attainment city. The second is there is an international day of clean air for blue skies. So in the 74th session of UN General Assembly, they adopted this in 2019. They adopted this International Day of Clean Air for Blue Sky. It is more of a awareness, awareness, collaboration, and uh, you know, data sharing and all. So it is about to combine effort of all the UN members to, you know, to have a common framework for or common, you know, agenda for reducing the air pollution. So yeah, they host it. So in, in this, the Ministry of Environment has organized the third International Day for Clean Air program. Sorry, sorry, Clean Air, sorry, International Day of Clean Air for Blue Sky. It's called Swach Vayu Divas. So to raise awareness and all, and uh, to facilitate action to improve air quality under our NCAP itself. So we are connecting to National Clean Air program. So here, in that, what they told us, out of 131 cities, 20 city, we have achieved the standards. Because these are the one, the non-attainment cities are the one, that 131 cities are the, are the one 
that does not achieve the NAQ standard that is prescribed by the CPCB. So here, this 20 cities have achieved it through the National Clean Air Program. So the theme is air we share. And they told that we have to, so it is to highlight that importance of uh, international collaboration, cooperation and effective implementation because you pull it in one country, another country it will wear. So all the countries should have a equal policies and programs and implementation strategy to control the air pollution. Then only as a globally we can reduce. We cannot, one country cannot reduce it. So that is a major idea of having this international day for clean air for blue skies. Then come to the report, specific report. So we got one report from UNEP, annual frontiers report of 2022, last year. Because why this report is sometimes it's important is it's related, it's a very controversial mention, controversial, we cannot say controversial report, it's a controversial mentioning of a city, Moradabad, in UP. So here, this report, coming to the report, they uh, identify on three environmental issues. The one is noise pollution, urban noise pollution. Now it is an emerging pollution. Second is wildfires and also any phenological shift in the pollution. So in terms of uh, you know climate change pollution and all, but here uh, air pollution, noise pollution is very important. So in this, we will directly come to the issue. So what they told us, the report compiles about the noise pollution. Delhi, Jaipur, Kolkata, Asansol, and Moradabad. So Asansol in also in West Bengal. So this four cities, sorry, five cities is mentioned in that particular report, saying that the decibels, 61 cities, the decibel level noise pollution is more. In this five cities, it is more. So what is the unusual thing is, they told that the highest noise pollution in the city, it is in Dhaka, that is Bangladesh, which is a value of decibels, you know, 70, 70 to 75 is a prescribed level to have a better noise control. So they told that in the Dhaka, Bangladesh, it is 190, 119. In Moradabad, UP, they told that the value goes up to 114, the second noisiest city in the world. So noise pollution in the city, mostly it is because of uh, road traffic industry and uh, high population density. Okay, why it is becoming a very controversial is, till now, uh, we didn't have any study to show that Moradabad has this noise level, because already we are monitoring noise and all, but we don't have any such a data to show Moradabad has got the highest noise level, but in the world itself, highest to second, highest to noise level, the report says, annual frontier report says that, it is in Moradabad. So it seems to be a little controversial. So that in that way. And normally noise, uh, since this report is a, it has come in 2022, sometimes there's a chance that noise pollution, what are the problem it will create? See, normally, first thing, noise pollution will affect the sleep. Once the sleep is affected, you can see the hormonal regulation, you can see important physiological process and all will change. Second is noise also directly uh, connected, that is traffic noise, as a high risk factor for cardiac disease and also elevated blood pressure. Okay, any sort of a heart disease and diabetes, so diabetes, it's also linked to diabetes, they say, because of uh, hormonal changes, physiological changes. And, you know, it will create psychological stress. So noise pollution. How noise we control? So here we have to be very uh, careful. That is, uh, in India, we have an Air Pollution Prevention and Control Act. That is for, it was created in 1980, 1981. It is for air and noise. So noise also generally get covered under the Air Pollution Act. But specifically we brought a noise regulation control rules 2000. So what they have done is, so normal noise standards, if you take a noise standards for motor vehicle, air conditioner, refrigerator, diesel generator, that is major things and all, it is prescribed under the Environmental Protection Act, 1986. Okay. So because noise pollution is separately regulated under industry-related noise. Keep in mind, industry-related noise alone comes under the air pollution and control of pollution. Okay, general noise, other major source of noise, rules, motor vehicle, air conditioner, refrigerant, 
pollution, sorry, refrigerant noise, diesel generator, construction equipment noise and all directly come under the EP Act. It is not under the Air Pollution Act. Okay, the second one, it's another small news about the underwater noise emission. So a study has showed that the underwater noise emission is also increasing. So here in Goa, from the Goa, from the 30 nautical miles from the Goa, they have set up one uh, hydrophone autonomous system. So, and they carried out a noise level. So in that they found that the marine sound pollution is very high, especially the underwater pollution is very high. So most of the time the result, uh, the reason for the underwater pollution comes from the shipping activity, military sonar, oil and gas exploration, recreation activity, boating, that and all, because continuous shipping movement is one of the biggest reason for underwater noise pollution. That's a major contributor. So generally the sound pressure level, underwater noise, if you see, it will be in the Indian waters, it is anywhere around 102 to 115 decibels. So the East Coast has got slighter higher than the West Coast. So you can see some 20 points will be more in the Eastern Coast. So Eastern Coast, has got more noise comparing the western coast. Okay, what is the problem with under noise, underwater noise emission? So that is also a major marine problem because it is also posing threat to some of the dolphins, manatees, some whales and certain dugongs and all because many animal you know, under the marine, so their uh, reproduction or feeding, foraging, that and all is based on the sound. So normally this sound will go and interrupt that sound. That is something called masking. Most of the time, the noise that come from the missionaries or from the ships or something, that will go and overlap with the marine communication, marine species communication. So that is something called masking. So by that way, so all these factors like foraging, reproduction, everything is affected. And also it will result in hearing ability, behavioral changes. So even in internal injuries and all also it's creating. So underwater marine noise pollution is also another new emerging threat we are finding, sorry. The next one is Kochi landfill site fire. So landfill is a site, you know that the waste material, all the municipal silt waste and all deposited and it is covered with the soil for a long term. So we generally we do it. So most of the time we will ensure that the landfill is separated from water, groundwater, surface water and all so that it is controlled. That's what a landfill we call. But why the landfill has got fire? So first and foremost reason is unprocessed. So in India, we don't generally uh, process the waste because if you say a municipal solid waste and all, collection wise, more than 80, 90% is collected, but processing happens only 30 to 40%. So all the waste has been put together. So since this unprocessed weight remains in a long landfill for a long period, so that could be one source for it. Second is high calorific value because we are also using a lot of plastic. Plastic, keep in mind, it's a high calorific value, plastic has. Even then the coal, plastic has a high calorific value. So gen generally, if you take an Indian solid waste and all, MSW, 60% is biodegradable, 25% is non-biodegradable, and 15% is something inert, like silt and all. So high calorific values material is also one of the reason. And the hot weather. So especially the hot weather, dry, it become inflammable, the risk hair increases. So in the Kochi land fire, what we found? First thing, we found a lot of air pollution. So in that, the more concern is particulate matter will come. Since improper combustion happens, carbon monoxide level is also increasing. And you can see sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, volatile organic compound and all will increase. So that will result in you know, respiratory diseases and it also creates smog. And during the monsoon, it can also create acid rain. And apart from that, the two important carcinogen, that is dioxins and furon. So it is also persistent organic pollutant. It's a byproduct of, it's a, it, it, this, we call it as a unintentional production. That is when you burn a plastic in a low temperature, this dioxins and furons also will come. So it is a very serious pollutant. So that also has come. So it will immediately have a much more impact. So sometimes they say that it is something equivalent to three cigarette packet smoking. When you smoke that smog of this Kochi, particular landfill. 
Second is ground water also it will contaminate. So don't think that is related to air pollution alone, because this fire, toxic chemicals and heavy metal that will leach into the ground water, ground and land. So that soil contamination is also happening. Ground water contamination is also happening. The ecosystem, aquatic and soil ecosystem is also getting affected. And once the soil is getting affected, plant will get affected. Okay, and it will also have once a fire comes, you know, economic cost is also there, losses, economic losses, business losses. So property, some property is also it's lost. That also happens. Okay. And then Delhi pollution, if you take, so Delhi pollution, main reason for Delhi pollution is a lot of thermal power plant, a lot of brick industries, brick clean industries and all. And uh, stubble burning, so already we have discussed it. Again, I don't to discuss stubble burning is one of the major cause. So all because of the air movement, direction of the air movement, and apart from that, the winter time, the temperature inversion, cold water sinks, sorry, cold air sinks. So pollutants are getting trapped in the lower level. And even some few months back, two, three months back and all, why Delhi pollution was severe is wind movement is also poor. When the wind movement is not, wind movement is not good, so stagnation of the pollutant is more. So that creates more smog and more, sorry, that creates more trouble in that. Okay, then there is one report. So this report is IQ Air Report, World Air Quality Report. So why, it's a basically a Swiss air quality technology company has brought it. So why this report can be important is, this report is, first thing, this report is based on uh, data from 7,200 cities from 131 country. So it's a large study. So they don't do any uh, technical study. Most of the time they take the report, they take the data from the countries and also they will take some data from the monitoring station that is operated by the government and other institution. So based on that, they compile and create a data. So in this, the key finding is out of that 131 cities, India ranked eight in terms of pollutant, especially PM 2.5. They closely monitor PM 2.5. The, the data itself is based on PM 2.5 because PM 2.5 is more dangerous. So if you see that, uh, it seems the India P PM 2.5 level is 53.3. Okay, grams, micrograms of uh, milli uh, per meter cube. But if you see the units, what that is prescribed by the WHO is only five. In Delhi, we have approximately, it is 96, sorry, 92, 92.6. India average is 53, but the prescribed is five only. The Delhi is 92. Comparing with the last year, it has reduced. Last year, I think 2021, I think it was uh, uh, 96. It has reduced, but still we are very, 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 very far away from the WHO. So in that, they mentioned about Delhi. Actually, they separated Delhi, New Delhi. So in that, Delhi seems to be the worst pollution state. Then comes the next emerging. Pharmacutical pollution, so water pollution. So it seems that nearing 50% or anywhere around 43% of the world river are contaminated with active pharmacutical, that is medicine ingredient. Now it comes another emerging pollution. So definitely it will have a very disastrous consequence on the human health. And so why in Indian context is very important is they say that India is one of the world third largest producer of pharmaceutical. So it is anywhere around 10,000 manufacturing unit, pharmaceutical manufacturing unit we have. Some or other way it is leaching into the water body. So here, Hyderabad, you know, the Hyderabad has the largest drug industries. So more than 3000 drug companies are there anywhere around 10,500 medicinal manufacturing units we have. So most of the time, how it comes, it comes. So people take, consume this medicines, men, women, children, and all consume this medicine, you know, through the excretion process, it comes and also from the industry leaching. So unused medicine, we throw it sometime that goes landfill, in turn comes to the water. So, so how it impacts the ecosystem. If you see the first and foremost thing, 
if you take uh, some of the pills especially estrogen estrogen related pill that is birth control pills birth control pills and all because when they took a sample of the water they found that estrogen level the birth because of the birth control pill medicines that content of the estrogen is very high comparatively very high in the water that is affecting the male that is creating a feminizing effect in the male fish so because of that male female fish ratio is changing that is one and also you know that post uh, menopausal hormones and all we have so that medical uh, medicines also is entering into the water body second is we are using you know lot of antibiotic so we have a very huge population lot of antibiotic when this antibiotic finally when it uh, you see some uh, when, when we take any antibiotic any sort of antibiotic excretion through urination it comes out so anyway it comes to the sewage so whether that antibiotic will be there so antibiotic when it is there automatically what it happens you see it inhibits the sewage bacteria because sewage bacteria is also very important am i right so organic matter decomposition that is getting affected that is the second one the disruption of sewage system the third one again it comes back to the drinking water because it will find the, anything is excreted finally it has to come back to us so if you take a municipal sewage treatment facility or any water treatment facility it is not we don't have a very efficient treatment facility to remove this pharmaceutical medicines so they cannot remove it so it will again come back to us in some form so which will have a serious health effect and also long term you know that it will definitely bio accumulate and bio magnify and especially antibiotics and all some form it goes inside multi resistant drugs so the bacteria whatever it's present it will create a infection so in india we find anywhere around 60000 new born they die because of multi drug resistance so in future if you don't control the pharmaceutical pollution they say that in future we will find more trouble with the pharmaceutical pollution since india is one of the major drug producing industry the next one issue with the forever chemical it is the per and polyfluoroalkyl substance so it came in the news it's a it's also sometime called as forever because it stays in the air water soil for a long period of time so it's a man made chemical most of the time it is used in the non stick cookware some stain resistant fabric cosmetic fire fighting so in other products like grease water and all we are using it so they can easily migrate to soil water and uh, during the production and use and they will stay there for a long period of time so we have within this we have different types of uh, po fs the different types of per and polyfluoro so some are classified in the some are classified as a pop persistent organic pollutant so you know that pop is very dangerous so it is a uh, uh, some are controlled especially po pfos is controlled under the stockholm convention so mostly what they will do you know that always a persistent organic pollutant will have a very damaging effect so it affects the fertility developmental effect it will go and uh, suppresses our hormones and you can see it will also change our cholesterol level and also some are carcinogen mutagen it also increases uh, the cancers so even a low level exposure also will create more trouble so the united states and all they called it as a forever chemicals the next one is a biomass co firing so in the last budget biomass pellet and all they gave a this a budget they gave a impetus so here so we'll directly go to the issue so biomass co firing so as a policy we want 5 to 7% of biomass should be used in the coal power plant so by that way at least 38 million tons of carbon dioxide will be reduced so this will help be helpful because when you are taking all the biomass when you when you use it as a co firing most of the time the stubble burning and all will be controlled so that is in that way biomass can be helpful but we have some challenges so what are the challenges so basically we can we can say it's a cost effective method and all so it is a one movement towards decarbonizing low carbon strategies but the one thing is we have to change the existing coal power plant because the coal the same coal power plant the structures whatever you know the same structure we cannot use it we need to do some retrofit retro uh, retrofitting and other changes in the 
plant then only it can be done so here uh, we will directly go to the issues so what are the challenges you will find is uh, it's good to mix coal and biomass but the problem is biomass has a high moisture content okay and also low energy comparatively so in that way you know the burning efficiency will reduce and also biomass storage is very difficult storage and transportation because immediately it will catch there are chances that it will catch fire and at the same time it will immediately it will accumulate moisture so storage and transportation is biggest challenge so converting into pellet transporting the pellet storage is really a challenge we have sometime they say that biomass cost whether it's a cost effective or something sometime what happens you see you are changing the coal power plant you are you are conserving the biomass because to maintain the biomass convert into pellet maintain the biomass itself storage itself it will cost more so now finally if you see that cost and the petrol sorry coal burning cost sometime the biomass burning cost will increase so commercially viability some have a doubt but anyway biomass co firing can be better so the problem always comes in the storage because during the storage also carbon monoxide can be released and at the same time in the storage accidents can happen that is fire can happen and also it will accumulate moisture also and at the same time once the moisture comes fungi microorganism will come so the question of long term storage of pellet is very very difficult okay and definitely biomass comparatively carbon dioxide emission is less but particulate matter and sulfur dioxide and all it limit so we cannot say that it will be completely clean so climate change related pollutant it can reduce but air pollutant will come okay now we'll go for the next section climate change so first we'll see the budget so what the budget says the budget says about india is moving towards a net neutrality am i right by 2070 so all the countries are planning for 2050 but we said that with our capability and uh, with our capacity on financing and uh, technology it is only possible by 2070 so already in the conference of party 26 our prime minister has has given a panchamrit change in the ndc so 2015 we gave the first ndc we have given a second ndc in the uh, glasgow in the last conference of party in that only we told the net zero that is the carbon neutrality we will reach only by 2070 so in that line so we have to work so for this what is that first thing our but our all our economic activity all our movement towards the climate change will be based on the prime minister principle of life so what is life lifestyle for environment so what is often we come come across this life so what is this life is it is nothing but lifestyle for environment we have to be we have to become a environment conscious citizen so under this they have under the life principle we have to adopt every common man every one of us has to adopt 75 lifestyle practices seventy five lifestyle practices normally comes under the seven categories seven categories for example go for led okay go for so, some of the thing i will tell you go for led uh, go for bamboos so go for bamboos even go for uh, if you have any old uh, books or something don't burn it donate it so that is one practices even tv remote tv after you see don't switch off with the remote go and switch off for the main switch so switch off the stabilizer so these are all some of the things okay go for drip irrigation and if you have any old electronic repair and reuse it so these are the some of the sustainable practices so when when the people adopt it they call it as pro planet people when you adopt all those things we call it as a pro planet people because we cannot spend more money but see we, we country like india country like other countries and all we can we don't have much technology we don't have money so we cannot go by technology so we can change our life practices that is a concept of prime minister life so what is the ultimate goal idea under the life is so we have taken a commitment that 
uh, at least we it's it is to bring awareness and to bring a pro planet people or better lifestyle practices at least with 1 billion indian people that is global global and indian people between 2022 to 2027 between this at least we want to bring 1 billion people indian and global both indian and global to adopt this practices seven categories of 75 lifestyle practices okay and before 2028 we want to make within india 80% of the villages before 2028 80% of the villages even the local urban urban local we want to bring them as a pro planet people that is environment friendly practices it is a five year program so what we need to do is we need to change everything so here it is a, even the government brings a as a policy so we have to see demand supply because the customer is the one who demands it now the customer has to change the lifestyle practices and supply the corporate has to change the distributor has to change so that is the reason they say it is a demand we in the we have to work on the demand side we have to change the people we have to work on the supply side especially on the corporates corporates are the one who produce the product especially especially on the corporate distributors who are maybe in the supply chain at the same time government policy so we have to work on the three level to bring the 75 lifestyle practices this is what life so in the budget they told that our policy will be based on the conference of party 26 that is the glasgow conference of prime minister 26 environmental conscious lifestyle it is something green growth we will go for a green growth so under that they told that seven priorities will be given so what are the major one the prime minister sorry the finance minister has told us so we will focus first more on the green hydrogen mission so at least by 2030 5 million metric ton of production of green hydrogen should come by that way because ultimately our objective is to carbon intensity we have to reduce am i right so this green hydrogen can help us to reduce the carbon intensity that is one second is the prime minister sorry the finance minister has told about the green credit program so don't confuse with green credit scheme 2020 we brought this green credit scheme that is totally different this is something called green credit program okay what is the green credit program so green credit program it is nothing but to reduce the carbon dioxide footprint so here under this the government is going to incentivize companies even a individual or even a sort of a corporate or local body to adhere practices lifestyle practice life practices under the environment protection act so if they if they try to reduce their low carbon and other thing so generally they will try to get a credit so for this they are planning for a viability gap funding and all so green credit program so it is to bring a behavioral change the third is they are focusing on mangroves mishti scheme a budget has been focused on mishti so this time this year mangroves they can ask question so you have to see about all the mangrove botanical features mangrove cover in india and all so mishti scheme it's a mangrove initiative for shoreline habitat and tangible income because we have come to know that mangrove plays a very important role in loss and damages second thing sustainable livelihood so it's not through the mishti program so we will take up lot of mangrove plantation so that is we go for a mangrove plantation along the coastline and salt plan and all wherever feasible wherever it is feasible and we will try to converge kampa and narega narega scheme so at kampa we have money you know narega scheme is something which is giving a you know for the 100 days of uh, compulsory work so through the mishti program we try to increase the mangrove cover so that you no know, loss and damage it can reduce at the same time it's good, good it's a blue economy is developed blue carbon is developed biodiversity is developed at the same time people livelihood is also maintained so that's the reason the focus this budget is more on the mangrove the next one is about gobardhan scheme so it is nothing but to create 500 you know waste energy that is nothing but bio compressed biogas plants so 10000 crores they are going to invest so 200 compressed biogas plant they are going to provide 
So it's called Galvanizing Organic Bio Agro Resource Dawn Scheme. So here some exemption. Uh, so for in, in order to cascade the taxes and all on the compressed natural gas, some exemption on excise duty, GST and all will be done so that to promote. So at least 5% you know, compressed biogas mandate we have to bring. So that's another one. And there is another scheme for wetland. Amrit Darohar. So it is to include the local people in the wetland conservation because wetland is a very important ecosystem. It's one of the high productive ecosystem. So in the next three years, we have to optimally utilize wetland, conserve the wetland so that improve the carbon soil because wetland soil is a very good carbon sequestration. Include wetland means it includes peatland and all. Today we are talking more about peatlands. It's a very good important carbon sequestration, carbon terrestrial sequestration. It can give a lot of tourism opportunity, ecosystem services. At the same time, it can also generate you know, income for the local communities. So this is another one. So focus. And also the last one is energy transition and storage projects. So anyway, we'll see that. Here we are planning for battery energy storage systems with a capacity of 4,000 MWH. So which will be supported by the viability gap funding and to go for a net zero objective. So all the, uh, the budget objective is in line with the net zero 2017. Now directly we'll come to the okay, convention. So convention part, so you know that there is a one conference called Stockholm plus 50. Anyway, it is it does not gain much uh, uh, popularity. So what is that Stockholm 50? The very first conference on environment is 1972. 1972, 1982, 1992, yet summit only, we have taken major decision. 2002, 2012, this is 2022, so last year. So that is something, actually it is supposed to be Rio plus 30, but they want to call it as Stockholm plus 50. So here, the planet team, the theme is healthy planet for prosperity for all. So that is a planet team. So responsibility and opportunity. So, so what they have taken, I think they have taken only general declaration. So it does not seem to be any specific declaration at all. If you see last, uh, last conference 2012, uh, it is called UN Conference on Sustainable Development. So that time they took some declaration on green economy page and all, partnership alliance that and all they asked it. So like that this year does not seem to be any very specific. So basically they spoke about sustainable development, lifestyle practices, circular economy they spoke about. They spoke about partnership and developing fund for pro-planet people, that is planet, planet people prosperity. They discussed more on zero pollution, net zero, and young people participation. And finally, collaboration of business, especially for driving, you know, the driving the changes in the environment. So the theme alone, I think you can keep in mind, just you can have a look at it. So much resolution was not taken. Then the next conference is about UNCCD Conference of Party 15. So that happened the last year. So it is a 15th Conference of Party that happened in West Africa. So here, uh, you know that Conference of Party, sorry, the UNCCD is about land degradation and justification, fight against reservation and justification. So the agenda is about drought and land restoration. So already we have one bone convention. So 350 million hectare by 2030. So they're also working for 2030. So in this conference, the theme is land life legacy from scarcity to prosperity. So what are the major things they have taken is, so they have taken more than 38 different types of decision. So first thing is uh, they created one working group called intergovernmental working group on drought for 2022 to 2024, two year plan. So in this, it is based on one report, drought in numbers in 2022. So that report has told that we are going for a more of a reactive approach for drought and drought mitigation, drought mitigation, drought management. We have to go for a proactive approach. So that is one. The next very important is we have a plan of at least 1 billion hectare restoration of degraded land by 2030. So that is what the Bone Convention is different, but as a UNCCD, we have a plan for 1 billion hectare restoration, but we are very slow on it. So they said that at least in the rest of seven years of time, we have to accelerate for 1 billion hectare of restoration of degraded land. 
and then three key declaration they took one declaration that is something called abidjan for the long term sustainability state and government long term sustainability the third second one is on boosting equity in the successful land degradation gender equity sorry gender equity the third one is about the report global land outlook 2 so one is on the long term environmental sustainability second is on the gender equality the third one is the on the direct on the the theme land life legacy that came from the global report that is a report come from the unccd that's global land outlook 2 report and then the next one they discuss about the green wall initiative if you see the green wall initiative only 18% of the project only is been achieved so just 18 million hectare restoration only has happened against the 100 million thing so we have to accelerate it for that green wall acceleration program they launched it okay so nothing much about so let us come to the last the next one unccd sorry you have to will see egypt conference of party so in the class we have seen till glasgow so we'll directly go to the issue what and all the major decision that has taken that was discussed or taken in the cop27 shamil shik the first one is loss and damage that's a key outcome so for almost for more than 20 to 30 years of time 2 to 3 decade we were fighting for loss and damage a fund for loss and damage so officially in 2013 in the un of wc conference of party only they brought in warsa they brought a warsa international mechanism for loss and damage so that time the rich country said that we acknowledge loss and damage okay but we will not provide any fund we will not give any commitment for funding for loss and damage that is what they told because already we have given a commitment in paris agreement gcf green climate fund 100 billion dollar we have given a commitment so apart from that a separate financial commitment we cannot give it for loss and damage but that particular scenario was changed last glasgow con in the glasgow conference they brought a santiago the joe biden has brought a santiago network to work out on loss and damage now in the egypt conference of party only they accepted for a fund for loss and damage we will provide a fund but anyway they told that a fund will be created but how much money will come how the agreement how the money operation will happen for what they are going to give money so that and all we do not know so we they have principally accepted there will be a fund for loss and damage so they for that only they created a santiago network for loss and damage last time itself this time they accepted for a fund but how the fund is going to come we do not know that's the second one that's the first one sorry the second one is on 1.5 degree celsius so in the conference of last conference itself they agreed that even though the paris agreement for 2 degree celsius we have to work for 1.5 so in that uh, we have to work towards 1.5 so for that every year we have to come and we have to uh, you know discuss on discuss for the purpose of 1.5 so that is something called that is every year you come and discuss and you make a commitment that is something called ratchet mechanism ratchet mechanism is nothing but even though the paris agreement says 2 degree celsius is a target legal binding target but the countries have agreed that every year they will come they will make the commitment stronger towards 1.5 so that is something called ratchet mechanism so some countries have backed it many countries have not accepted it they said that they will not come for it they will not come for the commitment of 1.5 especially like saudi and all there's a second one the third one coming to the fossil fuel so coming to the glasgow itself joe biden told that face out coal but that time we told phase down coal so this time when it came back so we said that so it was anyway accepted phase down was accepted principally but this time countries all the countries including india and all we said that we need to phase down all the fossil fuels not only focus on the coal but anyway so the debate happened but no decision was taken so principally they accepted rather than phase out we have to india and all stand is only face down okay then they spoke about low emission energy and all so in this 
the more discussion happened on the carbon capture utilization and storage carbon capture utilization and storage see there are two things one is carbon capture utilization carbon capture storage ccu ccus so carbon capture storage means you are capturing the carbon like geo sequestration capturing and storing in the ground something long term storage carbon capture utilization means you have to capture the carbon convert that into a usable so where and all you can use so let me say carbon capture utilization ccu so anyway niti aayog has brought a policy ccus so what what and all you can do you can capture the air carbon dioxide convert into use it for green urea even you can use it for building material then comes even you can chemical like methanol ethanol even you can use it for you can convert into polymers bioplastic sometimes they can ask you so cap the carbon captured can be used for what and you can also use it for enhanced oil recovery even you can mix the carbon dioxide with the steel slag that is in line with the paris agreement even for agriculture boosting also you can use sometimes they call the green ammonia and all so this is something called carbon capture utilization so two part we have carbon capture utilization carbon capture storage so niti has a brought a policy so they discussed on the carbon capture utilization and storage and no no emission energy so going for alternate energy then food security they discussed but more discussion on water systems because water security is a major threat so that they brought and they discuss on the technology technology they brought a five year program new five year program for promoting climate technology solutions and also transfer of this technology to the developing country so this is one the next one is the implementation plan the shamal sheik implementation plan so here the main highlight is to mobilize a fund because for a low sorry if you want to go for a low carbon economy we need anywhere around 4 to 6 trillion dollar this is what so for this definitely we need to change the financial system so how to mobilize this 4 to 6 trillion dollar per year we need for moving towards a low carbon economy so for this they said that we need to change the structures we need to change the government process we need to change central banks commercial banks institutional investors and all so that is the reason based on this they want to bring a reform in the financial institution reform in the financial institution especially world bank and other financial institution we have to reform it to in line with the you know paris agreement so what it was said as uh, if you take imf so they say that imf has a uh, approximately 1 trillion dollar is available so for financial distress and all but in this 1 trillion dollar the amount they spend on climate change is a small fraction so we need to do the changes so world bank funding japanese development funding whatever the financial institution funding and all we have to change the pattern of the funding so that more funding come to the low carbon economy so that is something called sham l shake implementation plan and then come to the adaptation so you know that gcf the rich country has committed approximately 100 billion dollar in the gcf but how much money goes for adaptation mitigation it seems that in the 100 billion dollar only 20 billion dollar is going for adaptation so especially for you know preventing the flood defenses preserving wetlands even for restoring mangroves and all so 20 billion dollar is completely insufficient so that is the reason we have to go for double so at least 40 billion dollar we have to do it but some countries have not there are some rich countries have not accepted it but they want this to increase more on adaptation because 20 billion dollar is not at all sufficient for adaptation then come to the mitigation so mitigation wise 
so we have to increase our more implementation actions work program for mitigation so they said that uh, every country should come with a national target that is national plan national climate plan for 2030 how they are going to do mitigation so that funding can happen according to that so apart from this they discussed on power road steel hydrogen and all and uh, the un secretary general has told that they will pledge around 1 trillion dollars sorry 1 billion dollar for developing early warning system because of the loss and damages and the g7 the group 7 the rich country and the vulnerable 20 so we have more than 58 vulnerable country in that vulnerable 20 they created a global shield against climate risk so for this so bangladesh and all is there so new commitment of 200 million dollars as a initial plan they have brought it the next one is they created a fast that is food and agriculture for sustainable transformation initiative in order to change the agriculture and food system so some financing has to be done so for that only they brought so because we want to change the quality and the amount of climate finance for changing the sustainable agriculture because agriculture is going to get more affected and indonesia has brought one indonesia and the g20 okay has brought one energy sum energy transition that is called just energy partnership transition partnership so in that they told they will mobilize 20 billion dollar for the next 3 to 5 years to acceleration for just energy transition and the last one is forest and climate leaders partnership so this to bring 2030 before 2030 we need to completely stop the deforestation so most of the time they will give forest and climate leadership partnership is taken in what so one word only it will be most of the time they don't get into the detail so it is nothing but you have to revise it many number of time okay so now so what are the issues we will directly go for the issues the first one is loss and damage major things only we will see so loss and damage they are principally accepted for the fund but the only thing is how the fund will be distributed for what they will give a fund first thing what will be considered as a loss and damage that is a question comes second is how do you know that suppose you take a, a cyclone comes but how can you tell that that cyclone disaster is only because of climate change so that is what first thing for what and all they are going to give because principally we told that as of now there is no agreement but we say that for all, loss and damage should cover all the infrastructure loss even some personal loss cultural loss so which we cannot quanti- which you cannot quantify that and all the developing country wants to bring it under the loss and damage but the developed country has not spelled out what is loss and damage because there is a even though we say loss and damage fund they have accepted so tomorrow when you give a proposal for a loss and damage you, if you ask for a fund they will say that for this we will not give a fund for this we will not give a fund so that is what the terms and condition and how the money will be given is not very clear so that is one issue the second is about methane anyway so sorry so coming to the methane you know that methane is a slcp short lived climate pollutant because it is a higher global warming potential so two things are important there is a lot of news about methane so first one is methane surging if you see during the covid period the carbon dioxide level has drastically reduced but the methane level has increased how the methane level has increased we do not know we know the real the sources of methane from wetlands from even from agriculture paddy fields and all and uh, it is also from uh, oil and gas coal mining livestock is one of the major source even from the burning any burning source also methane comes out but if you calculate with the known sources the amount of methane that comes out is something high so even nasa or even the uh, ipcc is not able to tell how much methane is entering and how much methane is going out but only one thing when the methane comes in the atmosphere 
whether the methane stays in the atmosphere till its lifetime no most of the methane is cleared naturally how it is cleared is by hydroxyl radical normally this hydroxyl radical oh they are all highly reactive they are normally present in the atmosphere sometimes the ozone in the lower atmosphere will also create oh this oh what they do is they go and join with the methane they break the methane or convert the methane into carbon dioxide plus water by that way the methane is clearing so that is the reason sometimes this hydroxyl radical the one noble laureate called this as a detergent natural detergent of the earth but today since more amount of methane because so sorry one thing this hydroxyl radical is not only cleaning the methane it is also cleaning other pollutant like carbon monoxide and all they go they oxidize with the carbon monoxide convert into carbon dioxide so like that it's a natural detergent detergent hydroxyl radical it's clearing many other gases apart from methane but the concern is more the methane more the methane react with the hydroxyl radical the hydroxyl radical is reducing because of the reason hydroxyl radical is not able to clean other gases like co and all the other pollutant levels are increasing and methane level is also increasing so we have a lot of confusion that is the reason we want to study more about methane and we want to have a clear picture on methane so for that last year you know in the conference of party 26 joe biden has called for a global methane pledge that is nothing but to reduce 30 percent of methane by 2030 so us and uh, european union has initiated but india and all said that we didn't join we didn't join because we said that it's not possible for us to join because immediately in the next 10 years and all we cannot reduce our methane because our peak emission itself is going to happen only by 2030 30 to 35 so in that context we said that we will not join second is we also created a global methane initiative so that is also trying to understand about methane so in this methane alert and response system mars methane alert and response system mars this was launched in the conference of party 27 So we have already brought a international methane emission observatory. So from this, we will take a data. From the data, we want to bring an action platform. So nothing but you understand more about methane, you understand the data, and then you bring an action to control that. That is something called data to action platform. So here, the methane alert and response system so what they do is they will track the large point of methane source so first initially they will start with the they will try to understand they will try to show how much methane is getting emitted from the fossil fuels then later point of time they will be able to tell from coal mining even from oil and gas reservoir and then even from wetland and all they will slowly notify by using satellites it's nothing but an alert and response system so it's a Slowly, it will be developed as a sophisticated system to understand more about methane. And one point, and the later point of time, even from livestock, rice field, and all, how much methane comes out, they will be able to tell very clearly. That is what methane alert and response system. It was also launched it. So it can be in future, it can be very helpful for us to understand about methane. By that way, we can take action on methane. Because if you want to reach 1.5 degree, we need to control methane. We should not control carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide life is. 300 to 100 years, 300 years, even it can be 700 years also. Now you control carbon dioxide, no use. Anyway, the existing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to increase the temperature. But you control methane because methane is a SLCP. Its life is only for 11, 12 years. So immediately you will get a benefit. So that's the reason the CCAC says that if you want to achieve 1.5 degree, focus more on all the short-lived climate pollutant like methane, even black carbon and all. Okay, methane source. So, uh, one additional information. Our Indian Council for Agriculture Research has developed one supplement for the, our cattle. That is something called Harit Dara. So, it is not clear here. Harit Dara. So, it is an anti-methogenic 
methanogenic feed supplement it's a anti methanogenic feed supplement so if you give it to the cattle it will reduce at least 17 to 20% of methane and also it will result in higher milk production so it is our indian council of agriculture research has developed it the next one is in the conference of party 27 they launched a mangrove alliance for climate so it was initiated by uae and indonesia and later india also joined it it includes uae indonesia india sri lanka australia japan and spain so basically it is to you know spread the education and awareness about the role of mangrove worldwide because mangrove is a very good carbon sequester the soil mangrove soil capture 2 to 3 times more carbon dioxide than the tropical rainforest and at the same time global warming wise it's a potential you know mitigation so this is not a legal binding and all it's a the sort of a intergovernmental alliance basically works on the voluntary basis there is no commit there it is purely based on their own country commitment so since we signed this mangrove alliance for climate we brought this mishti program so what is the data of mangrove so anyway it is better to see the data if you see the world 40% of the mangrove it is found in the southeast asia or south asia so southeast asia south asia has the 40% of the mangrove so anyway in the south asia if you take only south asia india has 3% of the total mangrove of south asia 3% of the total mangrove so mangrove cover so assessment wise yes it is improving more than 54 square kilometers increased so right now the total mangrove cover in india is 0.15% based on the mangrove cover assessment 0.15% of country's geographical area mangrove cover in the country the highest mangrove cover more than 42% is west bengal the second is in gujarat 23% the third is andaman nicobar the fourth is andhra pradesh this is order according to the assessment even according to the mangrove alliance so where the good improvement of mangrove has happened is the good improvement mangrove cover has increased in gujarat followed by maharashtra and odisha this is the latest status so in this conference of party we submitted our lt leds that is a long term low emission development strategy long term low emission development strategy okay so here every country is expected to submit their lt leds so if you take uh, many countries net zero is 2050 but our net zero is 2070 so what is our leds strategy see we are very clear in two things uh, if you take the historical emission so while preparing our lt leds so what india assumes is our contribution to the global warming historically is very less because even though we have world 17% of the population if you see the per capita emission wise it's very very less so that is first criteria when we create our ltld leds second is 
we also have a significant need for energy demand because without energy no economic activity can happen the third one is india is very clear committed to the you know low carbon strategy so we are moving towards low carbon strategy we want to build a climate resilience so our based on this assumption we have taken a vision of our prime minister has taken a vision of life with that only we have given our leds so what are the uh, components that is in the leds so what the this is the major thing that we do in our country the first thing is in our leds we told that we will go for a smooth transition from fossil to non fossil so we cannot go for abrupt thing that is what phase out we didn't accept phase down so one is we will move towards biofuel in that ethanol blending so when come to ethanol blending so we said that by 2025 we will reach 20% ethanol blending in the fuel by 2025 that is one second is we are moving towards e vehicle so that is what in the conference of party 26 27 and all so anything related to electric vehicles and all we have signed all the agreement so we have a fame scheme and all so we said that we are actively moving towards e vehicle that's the second one so our leds contains the second one third one we are also going for a green hydrogen fuel so green hydrogen mission we have created so we are slowly moving towards it that's the third one the fourth one is we are seriously working since uh, the urban is a Contri major contributor for carbon dioxide. More than seventy seventy five percent of the carbon dioxide come from the urban, especially from the transportation, from the building. So in that line, so we said that we are going for a green building initiative. That's what green building codes and all green building certification. So I told you there is one certification, Griha certification, am I right? Griha rating, and also we go for the other type of uh, uh, international rating like LEED rating and all. We are going for it, green building. Second is energy. we are going for a energy efficiency we are controlling the energy energy efficiency in terms of uh, going towards led and other thing and all so we have a pat scheme and all that comes and we are trying to move towards climate resilient urban that is smart urban city smart city so smart city includes energy efficiency as well as green building and also it also includes climate resilient urban so we are moving towards it the next one our complete industrial sector is based on the perspective of hatman nirbhar scheme and also make in india and we have effectively adopted pat scheme under the energy efficiency perform achieve and trade so i think i told you so in here energy saving certificates and all will be created will be traded so apart from that we are also going for a circular economy and we are also moving towards carbon capture utilization and storage for that only niti ayog has created it so these are the major component that is present in our leleds okay so in this line we have done an amendment in our energy conservation amendment act energy conservation act it's called energy conservation amendment bill so this is very important it is a, a move towards our net zero 2070 so under this we are this bill specifies a carbon credit trading scheme carbon credit trading scheme so we are going to the central government is going to create or the central government will or central government or authorized agency will create a carbon credit certificate carbon credit certificate which will be traded 
so what is a carbon credit certificate you remember the energy saving certificate so when you can when you reduce your carbon dioxide so every everyone will be every company will be given a quota to control the carbon dioxide beyond the quota you reduce your carbon dioxide that you can convert into credit you can trade it so those can those company who are not able to reduce their carbon dioxide will get their credit you can also sell it so we are going to the this new amendment in the amendment bill they are going to bring a provision of carbon trading carbon credit trading scheme so some author, authority agency will you know use it uh, say, sorry will run it and we will create a certificate so that the company individual can register and you can do it so this can even individual can also buy it so it is a voluntary it can buy the carbon credit on a voluntary basis so here what are the highlights of the bill the first and foremost highlight is uh, so first thing is as i already told you carbon trading scheme and carbon certificate we are going to bring second is we have made certain companies to mandatorily bring certain energy from a renewable source from a non fossil fuels that is something called designated consumers most of the time some large scale industries so they have to be they have to mandatorily bring certain proportion of the energy from the non fossil fuel okay and then we are going to create a energy this energy conservation code for building will be apply for all residential will be apply for will apply for corporates that is companies and uh, residential building with a connecting load of 100 kilowatt so for building or any residential building or office building if it is connected with 100 kilowatt electric load they mandatorily they have to follow this energy conservation building code and for vehicles and ship we are going to give a energy consumption standards energy consumption standards so here so this is a key provision we will directly go to the issues sometime there is a chances that they can also ask on the issues so right now they told that carbon the carbon credit trading scheme so according to the bill according to the amendment it is going to be under the ministry of power so here one small confusion if you see in all the country which country this carbon credit trading scheme will come under the ministry of environment because if you take a business even in india there is something called business uh, there is allocation of business rules so which department has to take care of what that is something called allocation of business rule if you see in terms of climate change related matters and all it is coming under the ministry of environment in also many country usa even in terms of switzerland uk and all this carbon trading the carbon credit dream scheme and all is coming under the ministry of environment but in india it is not coming under it it is in india it is coming under the ministry of power so this is something you know it is uh, clashing with the two business allocation rules that is number one second thing is this carbon credit market regulation who will control it there is no clarity no clarity on regulation of this carbon credit so they told that ministry of power will take care so who will control so how they regulate who will issue the certificate and all it's is something which is not very clear because if you take as of now related to energy electricity we have energy saving certificate so under the energy efficiency you reduce the energy 
you reduce the energy beyond your quota, you can convert that into a energy saving certificate. Now this energy saving certificate, basically it's energy efficiency. All right, it's purely energy efficiency. It is coming under the energy conservation, this conservation act only. Okay, there is an another certificate called renewable energy certificate. Renewable energy certificate. This renewable energy certificate, it is coming under the Electricity Act. Electricity Act. Okay. So normally uh, for energy saving certificate and all, it is traded in power exchange and it is completely, the certificates and all is issued, regulated, or I can say it is regulated by Central Energy Regulatory Commission. Okay, the same way energy, uh, renewable energy certificate also has its own regulation. Today, we are creating a carbon credit. You are creating a carbon credit certificate. Now, who is going to issue it? Who is going to, where you are going to trade it and all? It was not given. Second, one biggest problem what is this? See, carbon credit means you are reducing the carbon. Am I right? So what you will do, what a company will do is, let me say that the company goes for solar energy. They, they are using, let me say the company is using coal power plant. They are reducing the coal power plant, they're going for solar energy. Now that you can convert into carbon credit. But the same thing that also you can convert into renewable energy certificate. So which you will convert, how will you control? So whether they are all interchangeable. So that and all clarity is not there. So that is one of the biggest thing they told. So where it will come, so whether you can interchangeable, because you have, because what you do a carbon credit, sometime it can be even because of energy saving certificate that you can also convert into energy saving certificate that also you can convert into renewable because the same action, you cannot get two certificate. The company cannot reduce the, the company goes and installs a solar energy. And then they come and say that, okay, we have reduced, we have reduced electricity. We have reduced carbon dioxide. So they cannot get a renewable energy certificate. They cannot get a, so they cannot take two certificate, no. So how we are going to control it, how, whether it's interchangeable, that is what, that is what the confusion is really and who is going to issue it, how they are going to do it. So this is one concern we have. Okay, so only three things you see, energy saving certificate, renewable energy certificate, carbon certificate. So okay, the last two issues, we'll just see it. Carbon border adjustment mechanism. So in the conference of party 27, the European Union proposed for a carbon border tax. So what the European Union has told us, so in fact, they proposed in 2021 itself, the European Union told that from India, from India, from some country, developing country, they are importing iron, steel, cement, fertilizer, aluminum and all. So these are all very highly carbon intensive product. Now, when they get that product, in order to, since it is emitting carbon dioxide, in order to offset it, they will put a tax called carbon tax. But India opposed it. Because if you put a tax, unnecessarily price will increase, product cost will increase. Then the product will become very costly in that country. So we cannot sell the product. So we said that we should, they should go for some other mechanism. They should not go for it. Okay, but the European Union said that then only we want to make, we want to bring a clean product into us. 
because we are going for a net neutrality by 2070 sorry 2050 so if you want to bring net neutrality by 2050 so definitely the product that is entering into european union should be clean so that is uh, one issue we have So last one it is not there. Last one is Arctic amplification. So it came in the last year, two thousand twenty-two. If you take a hard take, so if you see from the mid 1960s, so it seems that Arctic is warming nearly three degrees Celsius. So if you take that means it is four times warming. faster than planet and it's not happening in all the place most of the time it is happening in the eurasian part especially in the barents sea b a r e n t s barents sea and norway so that is the region the warming is more so why a warming has to happen so the term common term is called both arctic and antarctic it is called as polar amplification polar amplification means it includes arctic melt arctic warming antarctic warming the main reason is definitely when you are change in the surface air temperature and also when you take a budget net radiation balance this two factor only when you have a positive climate forcing positive radiative balance for positive radiative forcing this two reason is a main reason for polar amplification whether arctic melting or antarctic melting but specifically in antarctic melting why so the reason is there are multiple reason they say so different feedbacks they say so you can say that so how much ice albedo feedback even the amount of water vapor feedback because water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas am i right and also it is uh, ocean heat transport even lapse rate feedback so they say that there are different types of feedback but to put it very simple why arctic is melting very faster why arctic amplification is happening simple arctic is a ocean on that ice is there am i right now when the ice is broken because in the summer cyclones and all ice and all is broken when the ice you know when ice is floating glaciers is floating on the ocean when it is getting melted faster the ice loss is happening when the ice loss is happening automatically the ocean surface is directly exposed to the sun so they say that ocean surface absorbs more heat because arctic is a glacier where glacier that is floating on the thing because the ice is lo ice loss is happening because this is a glacier floating on the ocean anyway in the summer cyclone all the glaciers are broken into pieces so it will get melted faster when the ice is lost automatically the ocean surface area is exposed to the sun the ocean surface area will absorb the heat that's what the heat balance is changing that is the main reason arctic amplification is happening so what is the consequence of arctic amplification definitely marine biodiversity will get affected you can see permafrost thawing will happen 
So when the permafrost thawing happen, a lot of trapped carbon dioxide methane will come out. You can see damages happen, the diseases will increase. I'm right, so many things will happen. But whether do we have any connection with the Indian monsoon? Do we have any connection with the Indian monsoon? Yes. It seems that it is connected with Indian monsoon. Arctic amplification. Okay, how it is connected with the Indian monsoon is, so even though it's not so clear, it seems that whenever there is a reduced ice in Barent Kara sea region, whenever you find the reduced, the reduced ice content in the Barents and Kara region, it is highly correlated to you know extreme rain in the September to October because atmospheric circulation is changing, sea level is rising. So definitely it has an impact on our monsoon. That is what the study shows. And apart from that, ice level is also rising. Even Arabian Sea is also warming more. Because of comparatively, Arabian Sea is cooler than the Bay of Bengal, but Arabian Sea is also warming more. So very simple, Arctic amplification, why it happens, even though there are many feedback, the very simple is ice is melting. So that ocean, ice is melting, the ocean surface area is directly exposed to the sun, they absorb more heat. So that's the reason the warming effect is very faster. Second is the impact wise, definitely it seems that it has a relationship with our monsoon. So whenever the ice in the barren sea, in the Kara barren sea region, when the ice is reducing, we find the rainfall is increasing more during the month of September to October. And also the ocean temperature is changing, atmospheric circulation is also changing. So this is geographically, this is what the relationship is. So it is something called Arctic amplification. So in fact, environment current affairs is a very large area. So we have uh, more than 150, 120 to 130 issue. But out of that, so I'll pick some of the major issues and discuss. Okay. So one thing is whatever. So rather than every day accumulating more number of information, so whatever the information you have accumulated, do more number of revision. That will be better. Okay. So with this. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.